If the US and China ever went to war, the battle wouldn't solely be fought on the domestic front. It would be a confrontation that draws in the entire world, one that relies as heavily on the military bases each country has set up around the world as the firepower and manpower that's kept domestically. These military bases prove to be decisive turning points in a potential war. That leads us to an interesting question. If military bases could play such an important role in a future conflict, how does the US stack up against China, or vice versa, on the base front? That's the question we'll aim to answer in this video, and we'll start with something simple. Defining what a military base is. Collins Dictionary says that a military base is a facility for the storage of military equipment and the training of soldiers. That basic definition only covers a couple of things that occur at these bases. For instance, in addition to be a training ground for soldiers, these bases, especially those built overseas, provide accommodation for their personnel. Soldiers are stationed at these bases, often for months or years at a time, and usually take on roles to keep the base running and ensure those stationed within it can respond appropriately to a military threat. And that brings us to the true purpose of a military base, establishing a presence. Where domestic military bases serve as training grounds and reinforce a nation's internal protection, overseas bases exist as much to allow countries to fight wars on multiple fronts as they do to enhance cooperation with the country in which the base is built. This is how the US has operated since the start of the Cold War. It has hundreds of military bases, all stationed in allied countries that exist as much to make the US a global threat to potential enemies as they do to serve as training grounds and equipment stores. What's more, these bases often double as command centers for overseas troops, meaning they're as useful at coordinating wartime efforts as they are for preparing a military to engage in combat. Still, in basic terms, you can think of a military base as a place where soldiers train together and equipment is stored. And with that definition in place, we can dig into the meat of our video. How do American and Chinese bases compare? First up are the numbers. The United States wins handily when it comes to the sheer number of military bases. According to Al Jazeera, the US has about 750 military bases in around 80 countries, giving it a truly global military presence. Of these bases, only a handful, three in Canada, one in Cuba, and two in Peru, are in the Americas. The rest are spread across Europe, Asia, and Africa suggesting that America believes its domestic military presence is more than enough to account for its needs across both American continents. Of the countries outside of the Americas that host U.S. bases, Japan and Germany are the most accommodating to the U.S. Japan has 120 bases, with over 53,000 American troops stationed in them, with Germany coming in second at 119 bases and nearly 34,000 troops. South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Italy, Kuwait, Turkey, and the United Kingdom all feature a heavy US presence too, with each having double-digit numbers of American military bases. Collectively, these American bases are split into two categories, bases and lily pads. A base is an American military installation that's either worth more than $10 million or covers at least 10 acres of land. These bases will typically have at least 200 personnel stationed on them, though many have more and they'll be used to train both American troops and foreign troops with whom the states cooperates. To give an approximate size for an American base, we can divide the number of US troops stationed in Japan, 53,713, with its 120 bases in the country to get about 447. That's an estimate at best, with the US bases typically containing as many troops as are needed. For instance, Spain's four bases have a combined 3,168 troops, meaning close to 800 per base. Regardless, the point is most American overseas bases contain hundreds of troops rather than thousands. As for lily pads, they're much smaller and cover less than 10 acres or are valued at less than 10 million. These bases may only have a few dozen troops and they make up about 40% of the 750 bases America has around the world. These are the types of bases you're more likely to see in countries like Canada and Peru. For instance, Canada's three US military bases are all lily pads that collectively host 127 troops between them. You may also see lily pads being used as supporting bases for larger American installations or simply as ways to maintain a presence in a country and ensure cooperation between the host and the US. Of these many bases, Al Yadid Air Base in Qatar is easily the largest. Covering around 60 acres, the base is host to 100 aircraft, a small army of drones, and about 11,000 troops split between American and coalition forces. These numbers indicate how the United States uses its military bases. Rather than taking the traditional empirical route of conquering a country before creating a presence within it, the US has usually operated in the spirit of cooperation. It works alongside other countries to establish bases rather than fighting against them. 
Doing so, the U.S. would argue, means it isn't taking an imperialistic stance toward its national interests. If anything, it's creating mutually beneficial relationships with its allies that just so happen to involve the creation of military bases. The other country benefits from America's military expertise and equipment, while the states gets more eyes on far-flung areas of the world. China's approach to overseas military bases is much different. It paints a picture where America's bases are simply covert imperialism, allowing the U.S. to maintain its power base on the global stage. As if in support of that claim, China only has one official military base overseas, the Dorle Multipurpose Port in Djibouti. That base is home to 2,000 Chinese troops, according to the Africa Center, and hosts a pier that's capable of accommodating an aircraft carrier. Small fish in comparison to the might and sheer numbers of U.S. military bases, but it's still a sign that the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, wants to project power from Africa. China's Djibouti base is interesting for two reasons. The first is that it was never supposed to be a military base at all. According to Africa Center, China initially presented the base as part of several civilian complexes that were in line with other infrastructural work that it was completing in the country. Beijing claimed that the base wasn't really militaristic in nature. It was a, quote, support facility, with China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs pointing to China's contribution to counter piracy missions in the Gulf of Aden as being the main reason for the base's existence. And to China's credit, it has participated heavily in these missions since 2008, allowing it to claim that it was sticking to its non-interference policy because the base isn't technically for the Chinese military. But it is. Back in 2015, China steadfastly refused to confirm or deny its plans to build a base in Djibouti, with a Reuters article again pointing to Beijing's desire to, quote, make a greater contribution to regional peace and stability as the reason for construction. A year later, the base was built and was playing host to a couple thousand Chinese troops. That's a far cry from China's claims that it doesn't want to build military bases abroad. And it's no coincidence that its Djibouti base happens to overlook the Bab el Mandeb Strait in the Gulf of Aden. As the Council on Foreign Relations points out, that strait sees anywhere between 12.5 and 20% of global trade pass through it annually. Again, that lends credence to China's claims of the base existing for anti-piracy reasons. The location just so happens to allow them to keep an eye on about a fifth of the world's trade as it offers protection. The establishment of the Djibouti base reflects China's general approach to building overseas bases. On one hand, it'll say that it doesn't want to have any military bases in other countries, while claiming the U.S. is acting imperialistically by constructing its own. On the other, it'll take advantage of the economic ties it has with other countries to establish a presence, though in Beijing's words, not a military one, in strategically advantageous territory. And if you doubt Djibouti's importance, just know that the U.S. has its own base in that country, Camp Lemonnier just a few miles away from China's base. That base contains 4,000 personnel, making it easy to see China's base as a direct response to America's presence in Djibouti. American sources certainly believe that the Djibouti base is just the first in China's plans to establish a stronger presence overseas. In 2022, The Guardian published a report based on an analysis by a U.S. research institute called A-Data. The report said China will likely look to build similar bases in three locations, Equatorial Guinea, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. The report also highlighted Reem in Cambodia as a possible location for a future base. All these bases would be naval, allowing China to extend the reach of its increasingly strong navy, and all would be placed in strategically advantageous positions in terms of China's ability to oversee commerce flowing through Asia and Africa. What's more, documents leaked from the Pentagon in 2023 indicate that China has resumed work on a military site it started building in the United Arab Emirates, or the UAE. The U.S. managed to put a halt to the construction back in 2021 by placing diplomatic pressure on the UAE's government. However, according to the Washington Post, construction resumed in 2023, with the base now having a complete perimeter wall and being connected to water and electricity networks. The Pentagon believes the upcoming base will serve as a logistics depot for the PLA, giving China another foothold in a strategically important region. That's not all. The same leaked documents reveal the existence of something China calls Project 141. According to the Pentagon, this project outlines the PLA's goal of establishing five military bases along with ten logistical platforms in different countries by the end of 2030. Djibouti was the first, the base in the UAE will likely be the second, and China's work on the naval base in Reem on behalf of Cambodia supposedly includes a contractual clause that reserves part of that base for exclusive Chinese use. For all of its claims of U.S. imperialism, 
Beijing is certainly active when it comes to establishing a military presence overseas, even if it's more covert about the true purpose of its bases. Still, when it comes to sheer numbers, the US clearly comes out on top. It has over 170 overseas military bases, while China only officially has one. And even with Beijing's plans for expansion into more locations, its presence will still pale in comparison to America's. That's not to say the states shouldn't be worried. China has been very clever about where it starts building its bases, and it's done enough on the cooperative front to make its host countries amenable to the idea of hosting Chinese troops. The Pentagon is well aware of this problem, with the report it delivered to Congress in 2020 highlighting that China is building bases with a dual function of serving military and civilian purposes, with the goal being to, quote, interfere with U.S. military operations and to support offensive operations against the United States, unquote. Beijing may not have as many bases as the U.S., but it is playing catch-up. And if the Pentagon's fears are true, it won't be long before China has bases set up in some very important locations. Of course, having bases doesn't mean much if we don't know about the makeup of those bases. What are they like? How many troops do they have stationed there? And what purposes do they serve? These are tough questions to answer, especially on America's side of the equation, given the number of bases it operates. As for China, the fact that it only has one official base means we can go more in depth on its specific composition and purpose. As we mentioned before, China's Djibouti base is believed to host up to 2,000 of Beijing's troops, but that's just the start. According to the East Asia Forum, the base is around 120 acres, meaning it easily compares to the larger American military bases in terms of sheer size and scope. And despite Beijing's claims, the base is consistent with Clause 28 of its 2015 National Security Law, which calls for the protection of energy supply channels, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that China is using Djibouti's base to strengthen its naval presence. The base is highly fortified and stretches further than the eye can see. Beyond its 120 acres of above-ground facilities, it's believed the base also has around 5.5 acres of underground space, suggesting more covert tactical operations are taking place away from the prying eyes of American satellites. According to the print, the base is more of a mega-fortress than a support facility, as it also plays host to a 400-meter runway that has both a helicopter apron and its own air traffic control tower. Then there's the pier. Built in 2019, three years after the formation of China's Djibouti base, it may be the most obvious sign of Beijing's military ambitions. The pier measures 1,120 feet, with Forbes claiming that it's large enough to host a pair of Chinese aircraft carriers, alongside four nuclear submarines and a host of other warships. China may claim that these naval forces are needed to protect ships sailing through the Bab el Mandeb Strait, but to many observers, these capabilities are overkill with the real objective of these capabilities being protecting Beijing's naval power in an important strategic location. Still, it's just one base. And when it comes to direct comparisons, we're spoiled for choice with the United States. But the most obvious comparison would be to Camp Le Monnier, which is stationed just six miles away from China's Djibouti base and currently serves as the United States' sole permanent military base in Africa. Originally established as a garrison of the French Foreign Legion, Camp Le Monnier came under U.S. control in 2002 when Djibouti leased the facility as well as the rights to use several neighboring port and airport facilities to America. Like China's base, it overlooks the Bab el Mandeb Strait and plays host to thousands of troops. It's also much larger than China's base. That's because the U.S. wasted no time in expanding the base as soon as it had the right to use it. According to the Commander Navy Region Eurafcent website, the U.S. signed an agreement with the Djiboutian government to expand the base from its original 88 acres to a staggering 500. That'll put it around four times the size of China's base when the extension is complete, though the work is estimated to cost $1.4 billion. Those expansion efforts over the last decade and a half have included the construction of an auxiliary support apron, a parallel taxiway, and in 2011 a drone apron to support the United States' Predator drones. According to Lee Neville's book Special Forces in the War on Terror, General Military, the base is also home to a secure compound that serves as mission central for a host of intelligence analysts and special operators who analyze the data collected by Predator drones as they conduct operations in several countries, including Yemen, Mali, and Somalia. The base also serves as a central hub for special forces operations, according to Neville. It's the headquarters of America's Special Operations Command and Control Element, Horn of Africa, or Saki HOA. That group oversees United States Special Operations Command, or SOCOM, units in operational and training missions throughout Africa. Add to that a host of U.S. Air Force assets, 
including a C-130J Hercules and an HC-130P Combat King, and the base is well stocked with forces that would likely be able to overcome those in China's neighboring base should fighting break out. Thankfully, it hasn't. However, the tensions between the two nations is growing. A year after China opened its Djibouti military base, America claimed that military-grade lasers originating from the base were being aimed at the eyes of its pilots when they departed on missions. China refuted the claims, insisting that it abides by international laws and would have no reason to use lasers on American pilots, so we ultimately seem to have a minor tit-for-tat battle between the bases that's a far cry from what would happen if a war between the US and China started. Still, when comparing the two, it's clear the US comes out on top. It has a larger base staffed with more people, and it's pretty open about using that base to conduct special military operations throughout Africa. The access it has to neighboring ports and airports also means that China's construction of naval and air facilities in its own base are signs it's trying to play catch up to what the US already has. But there is one wrinkle in America's Djibouti dominance. It doesn't own its Djibouti base. The country pays Djibouti $63 million in rent every year to operate the base, which it has the right to use until 2034, following the May 2014 extension of the lease. Right now, the US shows no signs of wanting to relinquish the base, as evidenced by its continued expansion. But what if China comes in with a much bigger offer than the US is capable of making when the lease runs out? Or what if Beijing can use its increasing influence in Djibouti, fueled by infrastructural projects, to convince the country's government that it doesn't need the US in the base? In a heartbeat, America could lose its sole African foothold while China works to expand its influence. Of course, that's conjecture. With China's Djibouti base in place, it appears unlikely the states would allow any nation to stop it from maintaining its presence in the region. Additionally, China is in the same situation, with its base costing $20 million per year, with an option to renew its own lease for an additional 10 years in 2027. Perhaps that'll be the true military base conflict that we see arise in the coming years. When the leases run out, China may make counteroffers to Djibouti, with the US doing the same, with the ultimate beneficiary being a Djibouti government that can name its price for hosting both countries. None of this changes the fact that America's Djibouti base is bigger and better equipped than China's. And the bigger problem for China is that America's Djibouti base is small fries compared to some of the country's other overseas bases. Take Camp Humphreys, for an example. Formed in the wake of the mutual defense treaty that the US signed with South Korea in 1953, the base is still technically under construction. However, it'll be an enormous 3,538 acres, almost 30 times the size of China's sole overseas military base once it's completed. That base falls under the control of the US Army, though it also has a marine presence. Or what about Thule Air Base? Though light on troops, this Greenland-based facility helps to facilitate 3,000 flights annually and is a staggering 233,000 acres. There's also Camp Hansen in Okinawa, Japan, which is a 12,000-acre base that's home to thousands of American Marines. It's also just one of 31 bases that the states has in Okinawa alone. Add America's domestic military bases into the mix, Fort Liberty alone hosts 57,000 members of the US military, and it's clear that the US is far ahead of China when it comes to bases. Still, China is clearly trying to establish a stronger international presence. It's just doing it in a different way than the US where America forms strategic alliances based on militaristic power and a desire to ensure global peace, China focuses on building economic and infrastructural ties that may allow it to gain the leverage it needs to build more bases. We saw that in Djibouti. The country has benefited greatly from China's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, with the Observatory on Contemporary Crises estimating that China funnels up to $100 million per year into the country. With Chinese investment came Chinese influence, which certainly played a role in Djibouti allowing Beijing to set up a base in such close proximity to Americas. That's a pattern we'll likely see repeated in the coming years. China enters a country under the auspices of benevolence, using its financial might to help with infrastructural projects, so it gains leverage it needs to campaign for forming a military presence in the country. It's a different approach that results in the same outcome as America's more direct militaristic offerings. But it's an approach that China needs to accelerate if it's going to come close to competing with the United States on the military base front. The simple fact is America has more and bigger bases than China's sole Djibouti fortress. That could be a major problem for Beijing if war were to break out in the near future, as well as being a reason for China to hold off on any thoughts about fighting the US until it's established a much stronger overseas presence. With all that said, 
Do you think China will ever be able to catch up to the United States when it comes to overseas military bases? The US and Russia, China and India, two separate long-term rivalries and two flashpoints for global war. But what if China and Russia decided to set aside their differences and join against an Indian-American alliance? Who would win and how would that war play out? The rules of this war game are as usual, no use of nuclear weapons allowed and no other allies can be called upon. First, let's take a look at each contestant's military might and see what capabilities each would bring to the table. First up is India, the world's fourth most powerful military, with an active duty force of 1.4 million and a reservist force of 2.8 million, India can call upon a deep pool of manpower to prosecute any war. India also possesses a formidable air force with 590 fighter aircraft, 804 attack aircraft, and a huge fleet of surveillance and transport helicopters that numbers at 720. India, however, suffers from a lack of attack helicopters with only 15 in its inventory. This may prove to be a crippling deficiency in any attempt to combat a Chinese-Russian incursion over its mountainous northern and eastern borders. India does, however, maintain a force of 4,400 combat tanks, of which about half are modern or semi-modern T-90s and the indigenous Arjun main battle tank. India is also equipped with a staggering number of towed artillery, 4,100 pieces meant to make it impossible for their Chinese rivals to penetrate Indian defenses across the mountain gaps of its northeastern border. Its naval forces include one aircraft carrier, 14 frigates, 11 destroyers, 22 corvettes, and 16 submarines, a sizable collection of naval hardware that its immediate threat, China, would be hard-pressed to defeat. Next up is China. China is the most populous nation on Earth and maintains an active duty force of 2.2 million with a reservist force of 510,000. With an air force totaling 1,125 fighter aircraft, 1,527 attack aircraft, and 281 attack helicopters, China has a serious advantage in the air over India. Yet China's pilots are undertrained compared to their Western counterparts and forced to fly under strict supervision from ground controllers, a huge liability in fast-paced modern air combat. China also has a force of 7,700 tanks and 6,246 towed artillery backed up by 2,000 self-propelled artillery, mostly ballistic missile launchers which would pose a significant threat to Indian and American forces. On the sea, China maintains a significant force with one test aircraft carrier not rated for combat operations, 50 light frigates, 29 destroyers, 39 corvettes, and 73 submarines. While larger in number than Indian naval forces, China lacks the ability to maintain long-term logistical support for any deployed ships, meaning only a small number of them could operate far from China's shores for longer than a few weeks. Underpinning China's military might is also the fact that its military is severely affected by systemic corruption, so much so that China's own leadership doubts the ability of the Chinese military to fight and win a major war against a near-peer power such as India. On to Russia. Russia has the world's second most powerful military, with an active duty force of just over 1 million personnel and a reserve force of 2.5 million. With 818 fighter aircraft and 1,416 attack aircraft, Russia's air forces are formidable but would be severely hampered in war by a lack of reconnaissance assets. As one Russian military analyst put it, we have long-range, sometimes precision-guided weapons, but we don't always know where the target is. On the ground, though, Russia maintains the world's largest tank fleet, numbering over 20,000. However, this figure should be taken with a grain of salt, as the number includes many thousands of Soviet-era tanks that have long been decommissioned and would need weeks to bring into service, and even once operational, would be decades behind in capability, firepower, and protection versus modern tanks. Russia's naval fleet has severely atrophied since the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it still maintains one aircraft carrier, nine frigates, 13 destroyers, 78 corvettes, and 62 submarines. Though Russian vessels are on the whole aging and plagued by maintenance issues, they are still armed with very modern and capable long-range missiles, making them a force to be feared. And finally, the world's chief military power, the United States of America. The US enters the conflict on India's side with an active duty force of 1.3 million personnel and 800,000 reserve personnel. With 1,962 fighter aircraft, and 2,830 multi-role aircraft, the US has almost double the air power of Russia or China, 
Its naval aviation forces alone are on par with either nation. Its fleet of 973 attack helicopters ensure that ground offensives are well covered and it is rare that an American infantryman finds himself without fire support. A proponent of blitzkrieg warfare, America also maintains a fleet of 5,900 tanks, almost all of them modern Abrams variants, and 39,000 armored fighting vehicles, giving its ground forces unparalleled mobility. While lagging behind in numbers, America's 950 self-propelled, 795 towed, and 1,200 rocket artillery platforms often feature smart, precision-guided munitions. In fact, of all the militaries in the world, the United States uses the most precision-guided munitions, featuring them on almost every combat platform and giving U.S. forces incredible lethality. At the onset of war, Chinese and Indian border forces stationed across the length of the Himalayas would come into immediate conflict. While initial predisposition of forces favors the Indian army, the narrow roads and valleys of the mighty Himalayas would make anything but meager gains all but impossible. Artillery would devastate any sizable forces trying to move through mountain gaps, leaving most of the combat action to light infantry units supported by helicopters. With Chinese forces primarily stationed along its eastern coast, India would initially have the upper hand both in the air and on the ground. Only a few air bases on the Tibetan Plateau could support combat operations for the Chinese, while dozens of airfields on India's side could put all Indian planes within combat range of the front lines. It would take weeks for China to construct makeshift airfields and air bases, and then rebase the bulk of its air fleet to the Tibetan Plateau, during which time, despite more advanced Chinese aircraft, Indian forces would enjoy a degree of air superiority. Yet the mountainous terrain would make it difficult for India to exploit that air superiority, and it would be forced to try to use ground attack planes when it would be far more efficient to use attack helicopters, of which India, again, only has 15. Once China relocated its mobile ballistic missile launchers to its western military regions, however, India would face a withering barrage of ballistic missiles that it could do absolutely nothing to protect itself from. Airfields and military command and control nodes across northern and eastern India would be devastated, and India's air force would suddenly find it very difficult to maintain hard-won air superiority, giving China the time needed to rebase its own air forces. Yet this is where China would have to make a very difficult choice. If it moves its forces to counter the Indian threat, it will leave the Pacific Front completely vulnerable to American attack. Caught between the literal rock of the Himalayas, swarming with Indian infantry, and the hard choice of leaving itself vulnerable to coastal raids by the American Navy, China may look to its Russian allies for a solution. Russia would need to carefully consider the strategic situation. Its Chinese allies desperately depend on the Pacific Ocean for trade, importing most of their oil via sea trade routes and with domestic reserves not yet ready to support long-term war. With the majority of China's trade and oil passing through the Indian Ocean, the Indian Navy is, as one analyst put it, poised on China's jugular and could easily cripple China with a naval blockade of Chinese shipping. America's Pacific forces are, on their own, also more than sufficient to cripple the Chinese economy with a trade blockade, and China's navy could not hope to counter America on its own. Desperately needing to ensure the oil lifeline stays open for its ally, Russia would likely try to bolster its Pacific fleet with large elements of its northern fleet. Yet, depending on the time of year, the Arctic ice may not have melted enough to open up shipping lanes. Either way, whatever naval forces Russia could muster on the Pacific would be needed to aid the Chinese in fending off the American Navy. This would still not be enough to save the Chinese economy, however, as India's navy would never have to leave home to stop all Chinese shipping in the Indian Ocean. With a very limited capability to support its own navy far from its shores, China could at best scrounge together a small battle group of destroyers and cruisers with perhaps a few nuclear submarines to try and break the Indian blockade. Yet with India operating so close to home shores, it could take advantage of shore-based air power and make quick work of any Chinese task force. In the end, China could not hope to stand against naval blockades by both the US and India, even with reinforcements from the Russian Navy. This is China's glaring Achilles heel. It's almost complete reliance on the sea for trade and oil, and why China has been ambitiously undergoing its modern Silk Road infrastructure development program with friendly nations, with very mixed success.
caught between the threat of raids on its Pacific coast by the US Navy and Indian forces pushing through the Himalayas, China would likely choose not to deploy its ballistic missiles to the west, as even if India managed to break out of the Himalayas, China's western territory is largely of little economic value. It would be far more prudent for China to try to keep America's carrier groups at bay with its DF-21 ballistic missiles, though China has still, to date, failed to show it has the capability to follow through on the threat of its ballistic missile forces by displaying a mastery of the various tracking, recon, and targeting systems and assets needed to go from launch to successful kill or the ability to properly defend them from US attack. At best, the Sino-Russian alliance could hope to hold India at bay in the Himalayas and could likely even push India back once Chinese and Russian personnel created enough forward air bases on the Tibetan Plateau to support offensive operations. Yet Chinese and Russian forces would be limited to advancing only as far as the Indian foothills on the western edges of the Himalayas. The narrow passes and undeveloped roads through those passes would not make it possible to transport large amounts of hardware into India itself, while India could hold vast amounts of tanks and artillery on its planes ready to crush any advance into Indian territory. In short, it would be guaranteed suicide to try to break out of the Himalayas for both the Chinese and Russian forces. Meanwhile, India and the US could starve China into submission by devastating its economy through naval blockades. It would take weeks for the US to degrade Russia's and China's naval and air forces, enough to attempt an amphibious assault against either nation, but the high casualties would make it a very unappealing proposition. Instead, the US could comfortably sit back and bottle the Russian fleet up while systematically destroying the Chinese fleet, leaving their Indian allies to continue denying China's desperately needed oil imports. A US-India and Russia-China war would end with very little territory gained or lost on either side and with staggering amounts of casualties for Indian and Chinese forces. The US Navy would likely see significant casualties, but both Russia's and China's navies would be all but completely destroyed. China and India's economies would be devastated, but China's specifically could face a catastrophic collapse that could even lead to the end of its Communist Party's rule. With so much to lose and practically nothing to gain, neither side would ever seriously consider such a war, but if they did, China's inability to protect its sea trade routes would make one side the clear victor. In mid-June 2020, World War III started trending on Twitter again. This time it was because a border dispute in the Himalayas between Chinese and Indian forces turned deadly, killing upward of 20 people. This is the first time since 1975 that the two countries have had a fatal conflict and the most serious skirmish since 1967. Naturally, as the two nations are populous, militarily powerful, and have nuclear capabilities, the world is biting its nails to see what happens next. But assuming the whole thing doesn't end in diplomacy or a world-consuming mushroom cloud, which country has what it takes to bring home a final victory? Using a mix of historical precedents of the prior conflicts between the two countries and our knowledge of their current military capabilities, we intend to find out exactly whether China or India would win if the two nations went to war today. After all, we're not just talking about dusty hypotheticals here. Relations between India and China have been extremely strained since the Sino-Indian War of 1962, which occurred over the same stretch of the Himalayan border that's causing conflicts today. India had granted the Dalai Lama asylum within their borders after the fallout of the 1959 Tibetan uprising, already putting them in China's bad books. And with China's military encroaching on the line of actual control, the demarcation line that separates Indian and Chinese territory in the Himalayas, a military skirmish was practically inevitable. The resulting conflict was short-lived, lasting only one month and one day between October and November of 1962. The People's Liberation Army of China had a vast numerical superiority over India's military forces, and India suffered significantly greater losses, with nearly double China's deaths, many wounded and over 3,000 captured. This loss is partly chalked up to the fact that it's believed, according to some leaked CIA documents, that India underestimated both China's military capabilities and their willingness to escalate the conflict. While India requested military assistance from the US in the form of 12 squadrons of fighter jets, their pleas were rejected, and India instead turned to Moscow for assistance. 
Ultimately, none of it did all that much good, as China claimed the Eastern Theater up to the line of actual control before declaring a unilateral ceasefire. India was left to lick its wounds, and tensions between the two countries have been high ever since, with conflict still breaking out well into the 70s. Both nations have ramped up militarization around the line of actual control as a show of strength, and this has left both with very little room to maneuver. In a sense, the Himalayan border is a military powder keg and lately we've been seeing the sparks. While a past record of military supremacy definitely works in China's favor, the Sino-Indian War was also 58 years ago, and failure is an excellent teacher. India has been engaged in frequent conflicts since the Sino-Indian War, giving their combatants invaluable battlefield experience. India is widely believed to have won every conflict they engaged in post-Sino-Indian War, with the exception of the Indo-Pakistani War of 1965, which ended in a ceasefire. China comparatively fought its last considerable conflict against Vietnamese forces in 1979. Once again, experience won out here as the Vietnamese, who'd recently honed their skills in battle against the forces of the United States, are largely considered to have handed China's asses to them. This is why the value of actual experience in war can never be overstated. But let's take a step back and look at what these two militaries have to offer in terms of manpower, technology, training, and resources. First, soldiers, the bread and butter of any military. Much like the Sino-Indian War, China has numerical superiority, though in India's defense, seeing as China is ranked as having the highest number of active military personnel in the world at 2,035,000. China's military has numerical superiority over literally everyone, with over 500,000 reserve personnel who could be easily called into action in a wartime scenario. China is a force to be reckoned with. India, however, isn't all that far behind, with 1,237,117 active personnel and an impressive 960,000 reserve personnel, putting the difference between their totals in the mere hundred thousands. But here's the big twist. The numbers here only pertain to the Indian Army, which is the ground force branch of the Indian Armed Forces, whose total number of active personnel are 1,444,500, second only to the PLA's total active personnel. However, the overall numbers of reserve personnel for the Indian Armed Forces now dwarfs China's at an astonishing 2.1 million. The Indian Navy boasts 67,252 active personnel and 55,000 reserves. The Indian Air Force has 139,576 active personnel and 140,000 reserves. In contrast to India's three-pronged system, the PLA consists of five branches – the Ground Force, Navy, Air Force, Rocket Force, and the Strategic Assault Force. The Ground Force is the Chinese infantry and land-based operations, with 975,000 active personnel. The PLA Navy has 240,000 active personnel. The Air Force even higher at 398,000 active personnel. The People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, also known by the pretty funny acronym PLARF, is the branch of the military in charge of the land-based ballistic and nuclear armaments. They have only 100,000 active personnel. And finally, the Strategic Assault Force. This is the newest branch of the PLA, established officially in 2015, dealing with extremely modern forms of warfare like space and cyber operations. This division is so new that we don't even have an exact number of active personnel. But due to the specialization of the job and the fact that the group is only five years old, it's safe to assume that it's likely the smallest branch of the PLA. However, we also have a far wider trend to consider here. The fact that China and India are two of the most populous nations on Earth, with populations of 1.393 billion and 1.353 billion respectively, as of 2018. In a situation of all-out war over their shared border, if both nations introduced conscription, the numerical differences between their armies would ultimately be nebulous. So if neither army would have an extreme numerical edge in the case of another conflict, let's zoom in and take a look at the average military service member in each infantry, specifically their training, equipment, and weaponry. Thankfully for India, they've grown to invest in more intensive military training over the years, including joint operations training with the British, US, Japanese, French, and Australian militaries as their involvement in the UN deepened. The Indian military has also consistently invested in modernized primary assault rifle systems for their troops, currently working with a mix of American Sig Sauer 716 assault rifles and an Indo-Russian AK-47-203, a modernization of the famously reliable and hardy AK-47. As of 2018, Indian infantry troops are fitted with SMPP ballistic armor, even capable of withstanding blasts from the steel core rounds fired out of an AK-47. All these factors add up to one formidable individual soldier. 
China's infantry troops don't have quite the same thing going for them. Modern Chinese military training has been criticized for years for its lack of useful applications in real-life combat scenarios, meaning the average military skills of a Chinese infantryman may leave something to be desired compared to their Indian counterparts. They're formidable in the rifle department with the QBZ-95-1, a reliable bullpup rifle which performs best at long range. However, despite China being one of the world's most prolific exporters of body armor, it hasn't historically fitted its troops with that same standard of protection. The PLA is notorious for its light loadout, often leaving soldiers ill-prepared for taking fire and giving the Indian infantry troops a huge comparative advantage. However, this may change in the not-too-distant future. According to a report from Global Times, China is investing heavily in updating and modernizing its training system, as well as planning on procuring 1.4 million units of high-quality body armor for the PLA. While this isn't currently a certainty, if these plans do go through, any advantages that the Indian Army may have had on an individual soldier level would essentially evaporate, leaving them dead even once again. But these days, war is far more complex than a large group of armed men running at each other and fighting down to the last one standing. In modern warfare, technology can give militaries the crucial edge they need to secure a victory over the enemy. Since 2008, China and India have ranked second and third respectively in global military spending, but the gap between them is still pretty immense. Last year, China spent an astonishing $261 billion on military development, compared to India's far smaller $71.1 billion. This disparity becomes a little more natural when you realize that China's economy is five times the size of India's. Let's take a look at how these numbers actually translate into vehicles for their armies, navies, and air forces. While China is generally packing more hardware than India, one exception is in the world of tanks, where India's over 4,200 stands over 1,000 units greater than China's 3,200 plus tanks. However, this doesn't paint the whole picture of China's ground capabilities. If we're looking at the number of armored ground vehicles overall, China's 33,000 dwarfs India's 8,600, giving them considerable ground superiority, bolstered by the fact that they have 10 times more rocket projectors than their Indian counterparts. China also holds dominance over the skies with 3,210 aircraft compared to India's 2,123. It also has approximately double the fighter and interceptor jets and 507 workable airports compared to India's 346. Once again, sadly for India, this trend continues into the country's navies. In terms of total naval assets, China outnumbers India by 777 to 285. More specifically, it has 74 submarines to India's 16. 36 destroyers to India's 11, and if wars were decided on equipment alone, it's unquestionable that China would take the win here. Of course, while nobody on Earth wants the conflict to escalate to this point for the sake of all human life, we'd be remiss to not return to the fact that China and India are both nuclear nations. If the war ever did become an exchange of nuclear force, who would come out on top? Well, for a number of reasons, China has a clear edge here. Not only did they develop their nuclear capabilities just over a decade earlier than India in 1964, New Delhi wouldn't have its first nuke until 1975, but their nuclear arsenal is also double the size of India's with a far quicker growth rate. China has a stockpile of 320 nuclear warheads, having grown by 40 in the past year. Compare this to India with only 150 nuclear warheads which grew by a mere 10 in the past year. Both nations can deploy these warheads via the nuclear triad of missiles, submarines, and bombers, and thankfully for the human race, both have a no first strike policy. This means the warheads can only be used in retaliation to another nuclear attack, making it less likely that either country would want to strike first. Of course, if either did, all of us would ultimately lose from the resulting radioactive firefight. But on sheer numbers, China takes the clear win with regard to nuclear capabilities. One final factor worth considering is one that's rarely mentioned in a lot of abstract military planning – allies. While it's easy to think of war purely in terms of enemies, your diplomatic and military friends can also be a make-or-break factor in determining the outcome of a conflict. While China could largely be working a solo war against India with the exception of perhaps Pakistan, a country with fraught relationships with India to say the least. India itself has been building diplomatic relationships with a number of extremely valuable allies. These include the United States, a country with the highest military spending in the world, who under President Trump have gone cold on relations with China while referring to India as a major defense partner. India has also developed strong diplomatic ties to Japan, France, and Australia through performing a number of joint military drills with all of them. Having these various world powers behind them gives India a serious combat edge over China, providing these allies come to India's side in their time of need. 
While the US could be India's greatest ally in this speculative war, foreign policy under President Trump has been known to be capricious and unreliable to other allies, such as the Kurdish forces in Syria in 2019. So there's really no way of telling for sure. So back to our big question. Who would win in a modern conflict between India and China? Turns out, it's a lot more complex than you may have thought. While a layman might assume that China's apparent numerical and monetary advantages hand it an easy win, these advantages can be neutralized by India's stronger troops, who are better equipped, better trained, and more experienced, and its greater network of powerful allies. Then there's the strategic picture. As while the Indian Navy is smaller than the Chinese Navy, India itself is situated on the jugular of Chinese trade, so to speak. Chinese trade ships must pass through the Indian Ocean to reach their destinations. And while China may have a larger fleet, it's not very well equipped to conduct operations far from its own shores. With only two aircraft carriers with a capacity of about 24 aircraft between them, and one not even being operational yet, any Chinese incursion into the Indian Ocean to protect its trade fleets would be disastrous, as the Chinese task force would be brutally pounded by Indian air and naval power. With China receiving the bulk of its oil from maritime trade routes, a protracted war between the two nations would inevitably cripple the Chinese military and industry both. India would simply have to fight defensively, as the terrain separating India and China is extremely difficult and well-suited to defensive warfare. While the Chinese could crush any Indian incursion into China itself, and there'd be few strategic targets to take close to the Indian border anyway, a war between the two nations would inevitably see India the winner, as it slowly strangles Chinese trade to death. China and Japan are two countries that have been culturally intertwined from as early as 400 AD. This relationship led to Japan adopting the Chinese writing system, the religion of Buddhism, similar political systems, as well as developing in matters of food, fashion, law, and more under the influence of China. Although the countries are currently at peace, relations have remained somewhat tense over the last century. Today, we'll compare the two nations in a hypothetical military matchup in this episode of the Infographic Show, China vs. Japan. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. The USA has the world's highest GDP of around $18.5 trillion. It's followed by China with a nominal GDP of $11.8 trillion and then Japan with a GDP of around $4.8 trillion. The European Union would take second place, but the EU is a combination of 28 states. While China has experienced economic prosperity in recent years, its per capita GDP ranks low, globally in 70th place, at around $8,000 with Japan's per capita GDP much higher at around $39,000. There is certainly less money to go around in China as it has the world's largest population of 1.38 billion people compared to Japan's 126 plus million population. In terms of military spending, China ranks third behind Russia and the military-minded USA with a defense budget of around $147 billion, which is 2.1% of its GDP. Japan sits in seventh place on this list with a $43 billion defense budget, which is 0.9% of its GDP. It's also worth mentioning here that military pundits often state China spends much more on its military than the number that is reported, although China's finance minister denied this secrecy in 2017, saying, let me be very clear, there is no such thing as opacity in China's military spending. While Japan is regarded as being a military powerhouse, its number of military personnel is actually quite small and very much inferior to the number of personnel the Chinese employ. Japan has around 250,000 active military personnel, with another 57,900 people acting as reserve personnel. China, on the other hand, has a massive 2,335,000 active frontline personnel and 2,300,000 active reserve personnel and paramilitary forces. Japan's personal numbers may be small, but it's protected with some of the world's best military equipment. This includes 678 tanks, 2,850 armored fighting vehicles, 202 self-propelled guns, 500 towed artillery, and 99 multiple launch rocket systems. Its large fleet of land artillery includes two machines often on the list of the world's most advanced tanks, those being the Japanese-made Type 10 main battle tank and Type 90 main battle tank. China, however, outguns Japan considerably with a total of 9,150 tanks, 4,788 AFVs, 1,710 SPGs, 6,246 towed artillery, and 177 MLRSs. China's Type 99 main battle tank is also highly rated, while the country also claims to have developed the most advanced tank in the world in its VT-4. China is not alone in making such boastful claims, with the USA and Russia also stating they have the best tanks in the M1A2 Abrams and the T-14 Armada, respectively. 
The VT-4 is as much a Chinese war machine as it is a profitable export, with Thailand placing a big order of the tanks and other countries showing interest in buying. Both countries have strong air forces, with China owning around 2,900 plus aircraft and 206 attack helicopters. Japan has around 1,590 aircraft and 119 attack helicopters. In terms of strength, China's aerial piece de resistance is its new Chengdu J-20 stealth fighter, which the Air Force and some aviation experts have stated can match America's highly advanced Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor and F-35. China is also the only country to have bought the Russian Beasts of the Skies, the Sukhoi Su-35 multi-purpose fighter. If you've seen our shows on these aircraft, you'll know the Su-35 alone is an impeccable piece of engineering. Japan would be hard pushed to equal such aerial military might, but the country is no slouch when it comes to aircraft. Japan is said to have created a veritable equal to China's J-20, having joined the stealth leagues with its own Mitsubishi X-2. Japan has some formidable combat aircraft in its homemade Mitsubishi F-2, as well as American-made F-4 Phantom IIs and F-15 Eagles. The country is also the proud owner of the USA's highly touted F-35 Lightning II. Japan currently has one of these aircraft, but another 42 have been ordered. With this in mind, the two countries seem to be fairly evenly matched in terms of Air Force equipment, with Japanese imports being a major factor. As far as naval power is concerned, a matter of significance given the history of naval invasions and the fact that the countries are separated by a stretch of water, both countries are credited with having very strong navies, although most analysts rank China above Japan. The People's Liberation Army Navy is said to have grown from a fairly weak outfit consisting of old ships to a formidable foe due to massive injections of money since China's economic boom. The Navy not only has well over 100,000 personnel, but has a large fleet of ships. This includes one aircraft carrier, 35 destroyers, 51 frigates, 35 corvettes, 31 mine warfare, 3 amphibious transports, 8 nuclear attack submarines, and around 50 conventional attack submarines. By comparison, the Japanese Navy consists of around 114 ships and 45,800 personnel, and according to nationalinterest.org, its fleet of 17 submarines is as good as any submarine fleet in the world. In total, Japan has 3 aircraft carriers, 43 destroyers, 6 coastal defense craft, 0 frigates, 0 corvettes, and 25 mine warfare. A matter of importance is each country's nuclear capabilities. Japan doesn't have any nuclear weapons, although it is protected by the United States under the nuclear umbrella. The country is well known for its highly advanced industries and technology, and there is no doubt that it could develop its own nuclear weapons given its nuclear energy infrastructure. This has so far not happened due to a non-nuclear weapons policy, although being positioned so close to North Korea, many Japanese politicians and military officials have called for a change in nuclear weapons policy. China, on the other hand, is one of nine nations with nuclear weapons with a considerable arsenal of around 260 warheads. Its first nuclear test was in 1964. The number of weapons, however, and China's development of nuclear weapons, has been a matter of wide speculation. For instance, a Georgetown University study claimed that China's nuclear weapons arsenal is not in the hundreds, but possibly 3,000. The study claimed the weapons were hidden in secret underground tunnels. The prospect of any kind of conflict involving these weapons of mass destruction, however, is highly unlikely. We cannot forget that almost every single tank, aircraft, or naval unit needs fuel to operate. China currently consumes approximately 12 million barrels of oil a day, but it only produces about 4 million barrels daily. That said, it does have 25 billion barrels in reserves. Japan, on the other hand, consumes 4.15 million barrels of oil a day, but it only produces a meager 3,900 barrels daily. Worse yet, it only has 44 million barrels of oil in reserves. China is set to be the first nation in the world to field an aircraft carrier to truly rival America's fleet of supercarriers. But how good is China's first attempt at a supercarrier? And why would a fight between the two likely end with China's brand new carrier becoming China's brand new coral reef? The United States has been operating aircraft carriers for over 100 years now, while China is relatively new to the carrier club. This gives the US a significant advantage over China when it comes to running carrier operations, which are notoriously a very tough and dangerous lesson for nations to learn. The United States earned its stripes through many years of very dangerous training and testing losing many pilots and deck crew in the process. However, China has shown it's a quick learner and has yet to suffer a major naval deck accident. While the plan has lost numerous aircraft as it learns to operate its new aircraft carriers, it has the benefit of emulating the nation that does it the best, the United States. Lessons learned from observing US carrier ops has significantly decreased the learning curve and reduced the price in blood China has had to pay to gain proficiency. 
But China is far from matching the United States when it comes to operating the most advanced types of warships ever created. Aircraft carriers are floating airfields, operating hundreds if not thousands of miles from home. They need to be able to launch very heavy aircraft at fast enough speeds to get them airborne and recover them by bringing them in from takeoff speed to a stop in mere seconds. Anything more complex than a routine training exercise requires careful coordination of hundreds of personnel and combat operations are something else altogether, with aircraft taking off and landing at the same time, a delicate ballet that the US has learned to perform expertly at a very high price in lives and aircraft lost. China has yet to show this capability, and while it has performed well in training cruises, it's yet to try the really hard stuff like combat-paced operations, such as launch and recovery at night and in inclement weather. The US Navy is an all-weather, 24-hour force trained to pressure an enemy relentlessly, giving no pause no matter how bad the weather is or how dark it gets. These types of carrier operations, however, are notoriously dangerous, and from time to time the US still manages to lose a plane or two. However, China has yet to attempt those more dangerous of carrier operations, and it remains to be seen how well its deck crews and pilots will perform when Mother Nature is beating down on them or in the dead of night. While they will likely learn to master inclement weather and nighttime ops, for now the US retains a significant advantage in this area. What about the physical ships, though? How do the two match up? First, it's important to note that the very philosophy behind the use of carriers differs between the US and China. The United States sees its carrier as a global force capable of fighting and winning anywhere on the planet. If you start a mess, you can expect the US carrier off the shore of your country within three to nine business days. China, however, is incapable of global power projection due to a lack of large surface combatants and global logistics capabilities. Thus, its aircraft carrier is instead meant for regional operations, never far from the shore or support of shore-based assets. This is good enough for now, when the greatest challenge the Type 003 might face is a fight against a US carrier strike group for the Malacca Strait. However, if China wishes to dethrone the US as a global superpower and impose its will upon the world, then the Type 003 is not the carrier for the job. China's Type 3 will be conventionally powered, which already places it at a massive disadvantage against a Ford-class American carrier. US carriers are nuclear-powered, which not only makes their range infinite but comes with a host of follow-on benefits. For instance, without the need for refueling, US carriers don't need their own dedicated oiler to keep them in the fight. This significantly reduces an enemy's ability to disrupt a US carrier by targeting support vessels. The Chinese Type 3, however, will require constant resupply, a link in the chain of Chinese naval operations that the US weapons are extremely well suited to breaking. Long-range stealth anti-ship missiles and the US's nuclear attack submarine fleet all pose deadly threats to support assets and will put pressure on China to fight more defensively than it would otherwise need to. The biggest advantage of the Ford's two powerful nuclear reactors, however, is their ability to generate more electricity than the ships need. This makes it possible to install future technology onto the ship without requiring a massive redesign or lengthy overhaul. The Type 03 doesn't have this capability and is largely stuck in the configuration it'll launch in. The US, meanwhile, is looking to soon add technology like directed energy weapons to its carriers and has more than enough juice to do so. US carriers are future-friendly. The Type 003 is not. However, this is hardly surprising. The Type 3 is China's first attempt at an indigenous carrier that can begin to match US capabilities. It's not a final design, so to speak, but rather one that'll influence the evolution of carrier design in the People's Liberation Army Navy. The Type 3 is also about 17 meters shorter than the Ford, at about 316 meters and a displacement of 80,000 tons, versus the Ford's 333 meters and displacement of 100,000 tons. Mass is important in surface warfare because larger ships are simply more difficult to sink. As seen in US naval live fire exercises on decommissioned carriers, US carriers are incredibly difficult to actually sink. In 2018, Rear Admiral Liu Yuan of the People's Liberation Army Navy stated that the US was so afraid of casualties that China could solve its territorial dispute with Taiwan and neighboring nations by simply sinking two US carriers. Liu said, quote, We'll see how frightened America is after losing 10,000 sailors. Rear Admiral Yuan has clearly never heard of two things. The first, Pearl Harbor, and the second, a 2005 sink -X, where the Navy tried to sink the decommissioned aircraft carrier, the America. The carrier suffered four straight weeks of abuse of all kinds 
until she finally had to be scuttled by onboard demolition teams. However, it's important to note that the America was not being subjected to real weapons, but rather controlled explosives. The point of the testing was to see how to build better carriers to withstand combat damage, not to immediately sink her. However, not only did the America survive an intense battery of tests, but the Navy also took the lessons learned from the 2005 Sink X and put them straight into the fore. The USS America remains the only supercarrier to ever be sunk, and China is not privy to all the incredibly valuable information that the US Navy gathered from such an unprecedented exercise. There's no doubt that at a fundamental design level, the Ford is simply better engineered than the Type 3. There is one big improvement the Type 3 enjoys that the Ford shares, and the Chinese likely stole it from the US in the first place. While previous Chinese carriers employed ski jump style launch systems, the Type 3 will employ an electromagnetic catapult just like the Ford. This means China will finally be able to launch aircraft with full gas and combat loads, something it's unable to do aboard the Type 1 or Type 2. Electromagnetic catapults also significantly reduce complexity, decreasing maintenance and operating costs, as well as being able to be more finely tuned for various aircraft and payloads. This directly reduces stresses on the airframe and extends their service life. But how mature is Chinese technology over its American counterpart? Nobody knows, and the US has been having notorious difficulties with the Ford's catapult over the years that have taken time to iron out. China is standing on the US's shoulders and has been able to bypass a significant amount of research and development though. Aircraft are a carrier's primary weapon, and here China is definitely on the disadvantage. The Ford can carry up to 90 aircraft, with about three-quarter of them being combat aircraft. It's unknown how many the Type 3 will ultimately carry, but it's believed it'll carry about 40 fighters. This leaves the Type 3 outgunned against a Ford. But the types of fighters also matter, and once more, China is on the disadvantage in this area too. In March of 2023, the USS Gerald R. Ford deployed with its full air wing for the first time, Carrier Air Wing 8. Currently, the Navy plans to operate its Ford-class carriers with a mixed complement of battle-tested F-18s and new F-35Cs. By working together, the F-35s will be able to dramatically increase the survivability and lethality of their non-stealthy counterparts, as the F-35 can act as a miniature airborne control platform, guiding weapons fired by non-stealth aircraft safely out of reach of the enemy to their targets. However, the Navy is well on track to fully operate F-35Cs from its aircraft carriers as production continues to ramp up. A flying supercomputer, the F-35C is an aircraft with no peer in the Chinese arsenal. Its stealth doesn't make it invisible, but instead makes it incredibly difficult to acquire a weapons quality lock before it's already firing at you. This advantage alone makes it a lethal threat to Chinese air forces, but with its Block 4 upgrades which will supercharge this already powerful fighter with a host of new electronic warfare capabilities, the F-35s will receive a capability no other fighter in the world can match, the ability to escort itself through skies filled with dense enemy radar networks. The upgraded AIM-260 air-to-air missile will not just neutralize China's only real current advantage, but overmatch it, with a range of at least 120 miles. The US Navy will finally outrange the Chinese PL-15, which is estimated to have a range of about 100 miles. The F-35 will also carry the Advanced Anti-Radiation Guided Missile Extended Range, a weapon specifically designed to take on China's anti-access area denial defense systems. Successfully tested against a moving target on December 8, 2022, the AAR-GMER can engage enemy radar systems from outside of their threat envelope, keeping its host aircraft safe. Even if the enemy turns off its radar, the AAR-GMER can use advanced digital modeling to locate its likely target and leverage onboard sensors to correctly identify a powered-down radar and destroy it. A missile believed to be China's new anti-radiation missile was spotted in 2020 under the wings of a J-11 fighter. However, little is known about its capabilities, though we do know that China lags significantly behind the US when it comes to sophistication of its weapon systems. The core of China's problem, though, comes from its carrier fighter, the J-15, nicknamed the Flying Shark. It's better known as the Flopping Fish in Chinese military media. The jet was based on a prototype Su-33 purchased from Ukraine, which the Chinese reverse-engineered, much to the chagrin of the Russians, who've watched China buy sample sizes of Russian tech only to reverse-engineer them and make their own versions. In effect, China made the Wish version of a Russian carrier fighter with predictable results. The J-15 suffers from a common problem that all Chinese jets face – bad engines. 
The Chinese utilize WS-10 engines built by Shenyang Liming Aircraft Engine Company, themselves copies of Russian Salyut Layutka AL-31 FN engines. However, developing aircraft engines is an incredibly complicated endeavor, and the Chinese have not shown that they're quite up to par. As such, the WS-10 significantly limits the operational range and payload capacity of China's air fleets. Recently, a J-20 was shown in flight with testing models of the WS-15, an indigenous design meant to overcome significant shortcomings of the WS-10. On paper, the WS-15 seems set to deliver the kind of performance that the J-15 desperately needs if it's going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with American fighters. However, as China remains one of the most opaque nations in the world on military matters, it's unknown just how capable the WS-15 engine truly is. What is known is that Chinese engines are notoriously unreliable. One American pilot remarked at the surprise of Chinese pilots when he told them how he had performed the circumnavigation of the Earth with his F-16 without significant engine maintenance. While the lifespan of US engines is measured in thousands of flight hours, Chinese engines are measured in the hundreds. The J-15 is also one of the chunkiest carrier fighters in the world, weighing in at 35,000 pounds versus the F-18 at 32,000 pounds. This is a significant problem when the plane is still stuck with inferior engines. With an estimated 60 J-15s in service, China also has a critical lack of combat-ready carrier planes to replace inevitable losses. The US Navy currently has about 30 F-35Cs and 273 on order, with 512 F-18s ready to roll. When it comes to numbers, the US is better suited to replace combat losses with better aircraft than China. But China is making strides toward developing the FC-31, a fifth-gen carrier-based fighter which has been spotted in flight testing. The US has stated that once operational, the FC-31 will be a significant threat to fourth-generation US aircraft, but it's unknown how it'll fare against US F-35s. It's also unknown when exactly the FC-31 will enter production or how many the Chinese will acquire. What is known is that China is lagging significantly behind the US, with the American Navy already designing a sixth-generation carrier fighter. The Air Force version of a sixth-gen fighter, known as NGAD, has already been confirmed to be in flight, so by the time China fields the FC-31, it might find the brief parity it enjoyed quickly overshadowed by more capable US aircraft. Ultimately, it's unknown which carrier would beat which in a one-on-one -on -one match, though overwhelmingly the signs point to a US victory. With far more experience than China and more mature and better technology in most areas, the US is simply the more competent combatant in this scenario. However, this is not a reason to diminish the threat that Chinese carriers can and will pose to US forces, as China has proven it's a very quick learner. And while it may lag behind the US technologically, the weapons China does field still present a significant threat. With only publicly available unclassified information to work with, the only way to know how each carrier would truly handle itself in battle would be for said battle to actually take place, a tragedy for the world at large as the planet's two biggest economic powers go to war. When the Infographic Show compiled our list of the world's most powerful militaries, our research concluded that in no uncertain terms the United States of America was placed at the top. The next two spots on the list were taken up by the countries of Russia and then China, with media and military analysts almost universally agreeing on this order. While Russia has been a notable military powerhouse for some time, China's emergence as a military superpower has been more recent. The country experienced meteoric economic growth in the past half century after opening up to global markets. Much of this new money has been invested on the country's defense, with China's ascension as an economic powerhouse enabling it to purchase the latest in advanced military equipment. Today we'll compare these two military giants in this episode of the Infographic Show, China vs Russia. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. We'll start with a brief overview of the relationship between the two nations in modern times. After the People's Republic of China was formally established in 1949, a close alliance was formed between the Soviet Union mainly based on a sharing of Marxist-Leninist ideology. The Soviets helped the PRC to both modernize and industrialize the country, but the relationship soon soured, leading to what became known as the Sino-Soviet split. For many years, the Chinese-Soviet border on both sides was armed with missiles, with China then seeing the Soviets as a bigger threat than Western superpowers. The dissolution of the Soviet Union ended this mutual animus, and the two nations are presently seen as being on good terms. It is China, though, that has been the rising star of global economic prosperity. Since the Chinese government introduced economic reforms in 1979, the GDP started to see healthy growth. 
China presently has the second largest nominal GDP in the world at over $11 trillion in 2016. Behind China is Japan with a GDP of almost $5 trillion, while Russia's GDP was just over $1.5 trillion in 2016. China's defense expenditure reflects its economic strength, being the second highest in the world in 2015 at around $145 billion. Russia's defense budget ranked in third place on the list with a $65 billion defense budget. Global firepower puts China's defense budget at almost $162 billion for 2017, with Russia in sixth place on the list at $44.6 billion. We should also take into account that the Stockholm International National Peace Research Institute, as well as the US Department of Defense, have said that China's military budget is much bigger than the number we see reported. China's finance minister, Zhao Ji, has publicly denied this. In terms of manpower, it may not surprise you that China has a formidable number of personnel, it being the most populated country in the world with 1.38 billion people. China has around 2,335,000 active frontline personnel and over 1 million active reserve personnel and paramilitary forces. Russia has around 766,000 currently signed up for active military service, although it's thought it has as many as 2.5 million active reserve personnel. We thought we'd try and find out what low-ranking soldiers take home each month in terms of wages. It's difficult to find the exact amount the Chinese or Russian new army recruit gets paid, but we found one Russian news source in 2012 that stated soldiers just had a significant increase in wages at $1,000 a month, and a Chinese news source from 2011 stating a basic soldier's wages had risen to $826 a month. Moving on to serious matters, we will now compare the land artillery of each country. Both countries are very well equipped, with Russia showing superiority in terms of numbers. Russia has a total of 15,400 main battle tanks, 31,300 armored fighting vehicles, 5,972 self-propelled guns, 4,625 towed artillery, and 3,793 multiple launch rocket systems. China, even with a much bigger budget, has 9,150 main battle tanks, 4,788 AFVs, 1,710 SPGs, 6,246 towed artillery, and 1,770 MLRSs. We should note that these numbers can fluctuate depending on when the statistics were taken and whether the equipment is ready for use. For instance, some sources state the number of tanks for both countries is much higher. A reflection of China's hefty military investments is its VT-4 main battle tank, which its military claims is the best battle tank on the planet. It currently has a possible buyer too in Thailand. China's other main tank is its Type 99. Russia could be said to have the tank advantage with its well-regarded fleet of T-90Ss and its current pride and joy, the T-14 Armada. Both tanks regularly make top 10 lists. Another notable fact is that Russia's army is much more experienced in terms of combat. Many analysts point out that while China's military is certainly modern, it's also largely encumbered with the fact that it hasn't Really been tested. According to the majority of media, Western media at least, Russia is more often than not considered to have the second best air force in the world behind the USA. Of its 3,100 aircrafts, its prized possessions are the multi-role fighters, the Sukhoi Su-35, a large number of Sukhoi Su-27s, as well as its highly rated interceptor, the MiG-31. China might be close behind in terms of aerial prowess, in some ways thanks to Russia and its exports of a large number of Su-35s and Su-27s to China. But the talk of the town if you're into Air Force combat is China's Chengdu J-20 stealth fighter, an aircraft which pundits, as well as the Pentagon, have agreed is a feat of modern engineering. China's navy has also seen large improvements over the last decade, taking part in the spending of the country's present fortunes. China's fleet includes one aircraft carrier, with another recently launched, 35 destroyers, 51 frigates, 35 corvettes, 31 mine warfare, three amphibious transports, eight nuclear attack submarines, and around 60 conventional attack submarines. China is currently working on its first supercarrier, the CV-18, a project obscured by the screen of the country's well-known secrecy. China is also working on a much larger fleet of ships, with nationalinterest.org stating it might just have the best equipped navy in the world by 2030 as production continues at a high rate. Russia's navy is lean in comparison and falls quite a distance behind the navy of China. Russia has a total of 60 submarines, 4 frigates, 15 destroyers, 81 corvettes, 45 mine warfare craft, 14 patrol craft, and only one aircraft carrier. Its ballistic missile submarine fleet is rated highly and is growing in numbers, and Russia also has plans to build a supercarrier, although developments are slow compared to China's supercarrier progress. Russia may have just come out of the naval scrap looking somewhat forlorn, but it's about to come bouncing back in a frightening manner. As we mentioned at the start of this show, Russia was involved in an arms race with the United States of America, a nervous time if ever there was one for anyone that is old enough to remember the what to do in case of nuclear strike infomercials. Russia built up a huge amount of nuclear weapons and currently has the most nuclear warheads in the world. Its arsenal of around 7,000 nuclear warheads is mostly retired or stockpiled, but around 1,900 are deployed. It's thought China has 270 of these weapons, although it is reported that none of them are deployed. 
Harkening back to China being considered a nation not always transparent about its military power, a group of researchers in the US once wrote a paper stating that China may have as many as 3,000 nuclear weapons stored in underground tunnels. This has never been corroborated with evidence or further research, with the Federation of American Scientists once impugning the research as exaggerated and poorly analyzed. The New York Times reported in March this year that although China intends to raise military spending again, it's the lowest increase in several years, suggesting the country may not want to get into an arms race that it can't afford. In the same month, some media reports suggested that Russia is cutting its military budget by a massive 25.5% following years of significant increases. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, most of the world's attention is on Eastern Europe and a potential confrontation between Russia and America. However, for those in the know, the real cause for concern is China's reaction to Russia's invasion. Rather than joining the world in condemning Russia, China has joined India in sidelining the seriousness of the invasion. Even worse, China now supports and helps spread Kremlin propaganda, suppressing the atrocities committed by Russia on Ukrainian civilians. Why is China so interested in helping Russia weather the global storm it unleashed? Because China has plans to launch its own invasion, and that puts it on a collision course with the United States of America. Not long ago, China's President Xi Jinping stated that China must reunite the breakaway island of Taiwan with the mainland. After World War II, Chinese nationalists continued their war against rebel communist forces, inevitably losing and being forced to flee the mainland for the island of Taiwan. In the years since, Taiwan has flourished into a vibrant democracy and a major global economy, but China refuses to acknowledge its independence and threatens military action and economic punishment against anyone who does. The problem with what would be an otherwise internal security matter for the Chinese is that the US has vowed to defend the fellow democracy against Chinese aggression. But why does China want Taiwan so bad? The reasons are numerous, but chief amongst them is because Taiwan represents a critical strategic vulnerability to China. Currently, China is hemmed in by what's known as the First Island Chain. This includes Taiwan, the Northern Philippines, Borneo, Japan, and the Ryukyu Islands. Originally, the United States used the First Island Chain as a strategy to hem in the Soviet Union and its allies during the Cold War and deny them access to the Pacific in case of a war. To that end, it established strong relationships with all First Island Chain nations and partnerships that continue to this day. Now the Cold War is over, but a new Cold War has dawned, and China is America's new rival. With pro-US forces all along the First Island Chain, China will never be able to be a true global power, as its navy is too vulnerable to attack. Taking Taiwan will break the island chain in two and give China an island fortress from which to project power deep into the Pacific. But Taiwan is itself a critical threat to China's continued existence, or at least its continued existence under the dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party. As a democratic state, Taiwan is an example to all of China of a different, better way of life, and many young Chinese people who are being increasingly exposed to foreign culture are growing tired of the oppressive rule of the CCP. For them, Taiwan is a beacon of hope for what China could look like rather than the nation of strict censorship, government intimidation, and very limited freedom that exists today. Despite erecting the Great Firewall in order to try and limit China's access to uncensored information, the influence from outside of China still reaches many of the country's citizens. This is a dire threat to the CCP, and thus neutralizing Taiwan and bringing it into the fold is but one step into ensuring its own survival. Next, it must topple the United States as the head of the global order so it can export its brand of authoritarianism around the globe. If it can control global culture, it doesn't need to fear rebellion within its own borders. Taking Taiwan is a strategic necessity if China is going to be able to challenge the influence of the US. If China is going to rise as the dominant superpower or even just one that can compete with the United States, it must also be able to control the South Pacific. Currently, the United States Navy operates with impunity across the Pacific, and this puts critical Chinese trade routes in serious risk in case of war against the US. China imports the majority of its oil and relies on exports for much of its trade. If the US were to cut this lifeline off, China's economy would shrink significantly. Taking Taiwan and throwing the US out of the South Pacific thus ensures the safety and security of its trade, and removes the dagger the US currently holds to China's throat in case of a war. But how exactly is China going to take on the world's most powerful military? Is it truly capable of challenging the US, and what do the numbers say? China's strategy to dethrone the US is to dominate what has come to be called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. 
The first industrial revolution was the use of steam power to mechanize production, allowing for never-before-seen productivity and efficiency. Not long after came the second industrial revolution, heralded by cheap and abundant electricity, which allowed mass production on an epic scale. The third industrial revolution introduced advanced electronics and information technology to automate production, and now we're building on this revolution for what will become known as the fourth industrial revolution. This new revolution will be a digital revolution, with billions of people connected electronically and breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, quantum computing, and other fields. Much like the first factory to install a steam engine couldn't picture what the world would look like just 10 years from then, it's hard for us to predict what life will look like in the wake of the fourth industrial revolution, though it is going to be the most revolutionary change in the affairs of human history. However, China is picturing the fourth industrial revolution as the key to global hegemony, and it's investing billions into ensuring that it is the dominant power in the new world to come. China's strategy to dominate the world in the coming decades is a fusion of civilian and military application of technology. First, it's striving to be a leader in the technology department, ensuring that it is the first to create revolutionary technologies, thus enriching itself financially and creating dependency from the world on Chinese goods and services. Secondly, China is seeking to quickly turn new technological breakthroughs into usable military technologies that will allow it to surpass and dominate the U.S. China envisions future technologies as increasing the speed of future warfare, with future military success reliant on having forces that are mechanized, informatized, and intelligentized. According to the 2021 DoD's China Military Power Report, what this means is that China understands that victory is only possible with fully mechanized forces capable of being quickly moved into a conflict zone and supported with heavy firepower. However, those forces must also have access to a wealth of information via disseminated sensor systems, with this information shepherded through artificial intelligence that can give battlefield commanders exactly the information they need at the moment, while temporarily ignoring what they don't. Warfighters don't just need information, they need help sorting through it quickly, utilizing what's presently useful. If this sounds familiar to any of our viewers, it's because this is exactly the requirements the U.S. military was investigating just a few years ago. China's Academy of Military Science has now established a mandate that the People's Liberation Army's warfighting theory and doctrine fully capitalize on disruptive technologies like AI and autonomous systems. Much like the U.S. did in the first Cold War, China's focus is on building a modern state-of-the-art force. But today's force must be capable of accessing vast amounts of information and supported by AI that can execute automated tasks and assist with decision making. China wants to teach machines how to wage war, so they can advise commanders in the thick of battle. Currently, the Chinese military is not very well networked, but those capabilities are increasing every year. It was only a few years ago that China first established a combined arms operations capability by establishing joint chains of command between its services in the same style as the United States. Now it seeks to match the U.S.'s networked capabilities by 2027 and then exceed them shortly after. But why is networking so important? Well, for one, it's what makes the U.S. military so immediately lethal to opponents. Having the ability to network together ground, sea, air, and space assets allows for the swift exchange of information and gives a fighting force incredible adaptability and initiative on the battlefield. For an example of what happens when a modern force is not networked, all one has to do is look at the terrible losses being suffered by the Russians against a nation of fraction their size and capability. In the 21st century, the Russian military is still fighting battles like it was World War II, and the Ukrainians are making them suffer for it. In order to become a global leader in defense technology, China is taking a page straight out of the U.S.'s book by pursuing a strategy of civil-military fusion. What made the United States the superior power during the first Cold War was the close partnership between its military and civilian industry, which thrived in an environment of innovation. Such a partnership allowed for a swift adaptation of civilian technological breakthroughs into military assets and vice versa. With the U.S. military technology breakthroughs quickly adapted into civilian technologies, making U.S. companies the most competitive in the world, artificial intelligence, robotics, quantum computing, and biotechnology will shape not just the future of warfare but of human society itself. Achieving technological superiority and leadership in one or more of these areas will make China a true competitor to the United States. Achieving hegemony over all these critical areas will make China an insurmountable superpower. In order to achieve the goal, China is investing heavily in domestic innovation, but also in foreign investment to acquire technology, the recruitment of global talent, academic collaboration for research and development, and finally, China's strong point, military and industrial espionage. So how is the U.S. preparing for this looming confrontation? 
First, as scary as China's ascension may seem, it's important to remember that it's still running uphill against America. Since the end of the First Cold War, the United States has influenced a new global order based on growing liberal democratic values. As we've seen in the global backlash against Russia, the New World Order frowns on the autocracies and abuses of the Old World. Vladimir Putin is a relic of the Old World with no place in modern society, and with a unified voice the West has shouted him and his nation down, even going so far as to severely hurt themselves financially in order to punish Russian military aggression. This should be of grave concern to China's Xi Jinping and his Chinese Communist Party, as they too are relics of the Old World. The uprisings in Hong Kong that lasted for months are but a taste of the simmering tension just under the surface of Chinese society, and proof to the CCP of the corrupting influence of liberal Western values. Should China follow in Russia's footsteps and engage the world in hostility, it too will quickly find itself a pariah and outcast nation, effectively crippling any bid to become a global leader. This is why it's important for China to undermine Western values. The United States remains the world leader in technological innovation, despite mounting pressure from China and beyond. But the US is far ahead in one important area of technology, its ability to rapidly commercialize new and emerging technology on global markets. While Chinese technology grows in influence around the world, American companies are already globally established brands. China's modern problem is in convincing the world to buy more than just cheap manufactured goods from it. US commercial success is also due to its global culture domination. American brands are present in every country on Earth, but so is its culture. With one of the most rapidly evolving cultures in the world, US culture can be hard to define or nail down, but cultural export instruments such as Hollywood and Silicon Valley remain unassailable by their Chinese counterparts. For instance, while China may have developed the massively popular TikTok app, it wasn't until China pushed the app on the American marketplace and established relationships with American influencers that the app exploded in popularity. This is important because military and economic might only count for so much, and the US has used culture to bridge ideological gaps with partner nations around the world. Shared culture is the bedrock of strong strategic partnerships, and China has absolutely nothing of the like except for its partnership with North Korea. Shared culture and shared values are the reason the US remains the leader of the free world, and not because of its military being the strongest. Culture is another problem for China in its ongoing confrontation against the US and the rest of the West, because one of China's biggest problems is creating immigrant Chinese citizens. While over a million Chinese Americans reside in America, only a few thousand American Chinese have made their home in China. If China seeks to dominate future technologies by recruiting promising talent from around the world, it must be able to entice them, not just financially, but also with a desire to make China their new home. This is a massive problem for China versus the US, which remains one of the most attractive destinations for the world's most talented, due to not just economic opportunity, but its liberal democratic values. Finally, China must not just triumph over the US in future competition, but against the world, because outdoing the United States in one or more areas of technological innovation means little due to wide-reaching US alliances and partnerships. For America, a win by one of its allies is still a win for the US, while China must stand against the world completely alone. But how do the numbers stand today? What if a conflict broke out tomorrow between the two military heavyweights? Currently, the US is ranked as the world's number one military power, with China in the number three spot. However, this is debatable as given Russia's extremely poor performance in Ukraine, we expect that China will climb to the number two spot by next year. Dethroning Russia, whom it seems derives most of its power from its ability to threaten with nuclear weapons. However, poor Russian performance should deeply concern China, because just like Russia, the Chinese military is also completely untested against modern capable foes. While Russian forces were more than adequate to crush uprisings in Aleppo and Chechnya, Russian superiority in numbers with equipment meant very little when it went up against Ukraine's Western-trained military, with China's last war being in Vietnam in the 70s, a conflict it ended up losing, China should be extremely concerned about facing the United States in battle, whom, unlike China, is thoroughly tested in modern combat. Much like Russia, China has lacked a robust training regimen for its military, with exercises typically being highly scripted and mostly for the benefit of visiting dignitaries. This culture has begun to change within China, but the nation is yet to match the robust training schedule of the US military. Realistic training, though, is not enough for the Chinese military, as it, also like Russia, must also contend with a legacy of corruption that has plagued its ranks for decades. President Xi Jinping's massive anti-corruption effort has produced great results, but the service must still contend with many officers who hold rank due to the time-honored Chinese tradition of gifting, wherein a junior official gifts a senior official in exchange for promotion.
Currently, the Chinese military numbers at 2 million strong, dwarfing the U.S. military in its 1.39 million strong force. This gives China a numbers advantage, but the U.S. retains a great deal of force multipliers that don't just even the playing field but tip it decisively in its favor. Chief amongst these is a well-trained and well-equipped modern fighting force, while Chinese units vary widely in modernity. A hefty investment in precision weaponry, integrated forces, and superior sensor and tracking technologies make the U.S. a lethal adversary even against a numerically superior foe. Reserves will play a critical role in any Sino-American conflict, but both sides are nearly evenly matched, with China having 510,000 ready reservists versus the U.S.'s 442,000. American reservists receive continual training of one weekend a month and two weeks out of the year, while training for Chinese reservists is improving but still spotty. This provides the U.S. with a smaller reservist pool, but one that is more quickly capable of being introduced into the fight, while Chinese reservists require longer training periods or risk being thrown into combat completely unprepared. The American defense budget dwarfs China's at $770 billion versus China's $250 billion, but that's not telling the whole story. First, the U.S. budget includes many costs for operations that would have nothing to do in case of war with China, such as funding for its 11 unified combatant commands spread out across the world. These combatant commands are responsible for general peacekeeping, and their presence is a globally stabilizing force. Without them, local conflicts would quickly sprout and spiral out of control. For example, without U.S. Central Command, Iran would quickly seek to neutralize regional adversaries such as Saudi Arabia, causing massive global disruption of oil and other trade that passes through the region. Also, China does not count all of its military investments within its published budget report, cleverly hiding them within other non-military budgets. A large part of its nuclear modernization initiative, for example, is coming from funds outside of its official military budget. Lastly, because Chinese military equipment is sourced locally, it pays less for goods than the U.S. does for its own equipment. And that's because the standard of living is lower in China, with lower wages and less benefits, which means cheaper production costs. When compared by purchasing power parity, China's budget is significantly closer to the U.S.'s than a first glance would lead one to believe. Any war between the U.S. and China would be waged at sea and air, making comparisons of the two sides air forces and navies of utmost importance. The U.S. operates an air fleet of 13,247 aircraft, easily dwarfing the Chinese air fleet of 3,285. When it comes to fighter aircraft, the two sides are close together, with the U.S. having 1,957 fighters versus China's 1,200. American air mobility absolutely dwarfs Chinese mobility, though, with a transport fleet of 982 versus China's 286. Understandable given that the U.S. faces conflicts far from its own shores, and China has little need to move its own forces significant distances. However, the massive advantage in airlift capability makes the U.S. military much more flexible and agile than the Chinese military. Perhaps the most important distinction between the two air forces, though, is the number of special mission aircraft, with the U.S. operating 774 versus China's 114. The U.S. has placed a premium on equipping aircraft for everything from early warning to electronic and signals intelligence and anti-submarine warfare. The U.S. dwarfs China in special mission capabilities and it's part of what makes the U.S. Air Force and Navy so lethal. Unless a confrontation between the U.S. and China takes place on Taiwan, attack helicopters won't figure into the equation. However, if they do, the U.S. outnumbers China with 910 versus China's 281. Numbers only tell part of the story, though, because the weapon systems used by both sides only further skew the advantage to the U.S. For air superiority, the U.S. fields the F-15 Eagle and F-18 Super Hornet. A fleet of 187 operational F-22s are unmatched by China, who has yet to field its own fifth-generation fighter in any significant numbers. Adding to China's problem is the U.S.'s Rapid Raptor program, which aims to bring a sizable contingent of F-22s to any battle space in the world within 24 hours. China's competitor versus the Raptor is the J-20, which is equipped with inferior engines versus American planes, requiring the use of canards on the body of the plane. These canards and other obvious engineering flaws have led to defense analysts to conclude the J-20 has at best only a slightly smaller radar cross-section than a traditional fourth-generation fighter. In fact, India claims it has frequently observed and tracked Chinese J-20s with long-range radar. The rest of the Chinese Air Force varies widely in modernity, with a significant part of its Air Force still flying Cold War Russian-made or Chinese-licensed relics. 
While China would initially put its most modern fighters such as the J-16s, J-11s, and Su-30s into the fight first, once those have been downed, it'll be increasingly reliant on older and older planes. Meanwhile, the United States doesn't just have a completely modern air fleet, but it's adding dozens of fifth-generation F-35s every year to its arsenal. The U.S. Air Force now has over 280 F-35s it can bring to the fight, with an additional 157 being added a year across the various services. In a war where air power would be decisive, the U.S. not only has the numbers advantage but also the technological advantage. At sea, the U.S. Navy is outnumbered by the Chinese Navy, with 484 vessels versus China's 777. However, there are numbers once again only telling part of the story. The U.S. operates 11 aircraft carriers versus China's two, and American aircraft carriers can bring over 800 aircraft into the fight versus China's grand total of 70. China's inflated naval numbers take into account things like missile boats, of which it has 84, while the U.S. only operates 10. In terms of tonnage, the U.S. Navy has over twice the hardware of the Chinese Navy, 4.6 million tons versus 2 million tons. A better way to compare the capabilities of the two fleets is to use a modern metric, battle force missiles. This is a count of the total number of missiles that a fleet has for use in combat before requiring resupply. This includes anti-ship missiles, land attack missiles, surface-to-air missiles, and torpedoes. Excluded from the count are short-range self-defense missiles like the U.S.'s Sea Ram. In 2019, the U.S. Navy had 11,834 battle force missiles versus China's 5,250. The gap is narrowing but not significantly, with China adding 15 more Type 55 cruisers with 112 missile cells and 6 torpedo tubes each throughout the 2020s. That will increase total battle force missiles by 1,770, just over half of what the U.S. fields. Under the surface, China has the advantage with 71 submarines versus the U.S.'s 68. However, Chinese subs are mostly conventionally powered, while the U.S. subs are all nuclear. That makes U.S. submarines much more robust and able to operate for longer, but also decreases their vulnerability while operating. Chinese submarines are also an order of magnitude louder than U.S. subs, with their Jin-class ballistic missile submarines having an acoustic signature of around 120 decibels, while American Virginia-class submarines have an acoustic signature of 95 decibels, which is just 5 decibels over background ocean noise at an average of 90 decibels. Submarine warfare has always been a weakness of China, and it looks to continue being so for the foreseeable future. While the U.S. clearly has the naval advantage, it's important to remember that China can concentrate most of its fleet into a Pacific war against America, while the U.S. has naval commitments around the world. Even if it were to recall the bulk of its fleet for action in the Pacific, such an act would take from days to weeks to mature into a sizable transit of combat power into the theater. Realistically speaking, the U.S. Navy maintains an edge over China, but the two sides are very close to parity in terms of capabilities. Where the U.S. advantage comes is in its ability to quickly replenish combat losses with well-trained crews and modern ships, while Chinese combat losses are not so easily replaced. Further honing America's advantage over China is its partnership with regional powers such as Japan and Australia, who would either allow the U.S. to use their territory as bases of operation for war against China or very likely join the conflict itself. A new trilateral defense pact between the United Kingdom, the United States, and Australia is even seeing the U.S. building nuclear attack submarines for Australia on the condition that in case of war, it will join in the effort against the People's Liberation Army, Navy, and Air Force. America's advantage in equipment and technology is sizable and looks set to remain so, but it's the U.S. global partnerships and championing of liberal values that present the greatest likely insurmountable challenge for China. Until the Chinese Communist Party changes its core values, if it wishes to fight against America, it's picking a fight against most of the free world. The date is July 2019, and rumors of a military buildup of Chinese forces across the strait from Taiwan begin to leak to the international press. As the 4th of July is celebrated here at home, thousands of miles away, Taiwan begins to move their command and control functions into hardened nuclear-proof underground facilities. F-16s and other strike aircraft are moved into mountain bases, and dummy missile batteries and anti-aircraft platforms are set up around the island of Taiwan. August rolls around, and by now it's clear to the world that China is indeed massing what looks like an invasion force on its side of the Taiwan Strait. Though the Chinese leader Xi Jinping reassures the world that he's only interested in a peaceful reunification of Taiwan and the mainland. The American military is put at DEFCON 3, which signals the Air Force to be ready to mobilize for a potential nuclear conflict in just 15 minutes. 
As September comes, the Chinese military has begun commandeering civilian ships in order to help move its one million man strong invasion force across the channel. The Chinese military lacks the amphibious capability to move more than a few thousand troops at a time. But in order to face 100,000 Taiwanese defenders and their 2 million reservists, the People's Liberation Army will need every available ship it can get its hands on, no matter how big or small. Across the strait, Taiwan has begun littering the only 13 beaches that an invasion force could be landed on with mines, razor wire, and other horrific surprises. The US Pacific Fleet is fully mobilized by now, and the United States is at DEFCON 2. All military leave is cancelled, and Marines board transports as they head for bases in Australia, Japan, and Guam. PACCOM's carrier groups disperse a thousand miles offshore from Taiwan, careful to make sure that they do not stray too deep into the net of ballistic missile coverage that China uses to threaten American naval vessels. There's no hiding China's intentions now. An invasion of Taiwan is coming, and the entire world knows it. Taiwanese troops, supplemented by a few thousand rapid response American forces, dig in for what will be the largest amphibious assault in history. The date is October 3rd, 2019. The seas between Taiwan and China are finally calm again, presenting a narrow four-week opportunity for an amphibious assault that only reoccurs briefly one other time of the year in May. Chinese troops are rushed to waiting transports. The lucky ones board military amphibious landing craft, while the unlucky ones must make the treacherous crossing on civilian boats with little if any protection. Overhead, hundreds of missiles fly out over the strait, slamming into radar, communications, and control nodes all over the island. Airfields are cratered. Civilian power plants are destroyed. Chinese jets scream overhead en route to strike at Taiwanese tanks and artillery pieces, shortly after followed by Chinese bombers. Yet the Taiwanese Air Force has long been redeployed to underground facilities, and American-made F-16s flown by Taiwanese pilots rise up to meet the incoming Chinese planes. A thousand miles away, U.S. carrier battle groups are given the green light to advance to forward positions just off the Taiwan coast, bringing a significant portion of America's naval air power. They alone are more than a match for the Chinese Air Force. Yet as they steam ahead, a rain of ballistic missiles falls upon the battle groups. Anti-missile defense systems intercept many, yet others manage to slip through and deal devastating blows against American supercarriers. In moments, thousands of American sailors are dead. And in the first five minutes of the war, more American servicemen have died than in all conflicts combined since Vietnam. By the end of the first month of fighting, American casualties will reach Vietnam War levels, with Chinese and Taiwanese casualties many times that number. By the end of 2019, the war will officially be the bloodiest conflict since World War II. But could such a war really happen? And if it did, could you actually be drafted to fight in it? The sad answer is yes. And in fact, American military planners consider the Taiwan-China situation to be one of the several flashpoints that would lead directly to a third world war. China, for its part, has long claimed that it seeks only a peaceful reunification with the island nation. Yet, just in 2016, Xi Jinping stated, We have the determination, the ability, and the preparedness to deal with Taiwanese independence. And if we do not deal with it, we will be overthrown. China views Taiwan's continued independence as more than the historical thorn in its side, but now rather as a direct threat to the mainland's continued communist leadership. This is because the island nation has only grown more prosperous and economically powerful over the decades, becoming the 19th largest economy in the world. Taiwan also directly employs many mainland Chinese citizens, either on the island itself or in off-site factories and offices run by Taiwanese businesses. The same cannot be said in large numbers of China's influence on Taiwan. Yet even more dangerous than Taiwan's prosperity is what Xi Jinping and Chinese leadership fear the most, its liberal democracy. Taiwan's liberal democratic values completely undermined China's own hardline nationalistic values. While China enforces strict censorship, Taiwan espouses the same liberal values that America does, and mainland Chinese have begun to take notice. Pro-democracy demonstrations continue to grow within China, and as Chinese citizens spend more time abroad both in Taiwan and Europe and America, they are starting to bring democratic values back home with them. For China, Taiwan's continued independence is a deathly threat that must one day be eliminated and increasingly it looks like plans to eliminate Taiwan's independence are to do so by force. Yet if China were to launch a war against Taiwan, currently one of the likeliest conflicts that the US actively prepares for, then America would be treaty bound to defend the island democracy. 
This would pit the two largest economies and military powers in the world against each other. And while the US would inevitably come out slightly ahead of China, casualties on both sides would be staggering. To this end, America would immediately need to boost its active military forces. The first step in bolstering American forces would be an immediate call-up of all reservists. With 860,000 reservists, any draft notices would likely not come for a while. Yet, depending on the scale of the war and America's objectives, a draft may ultimately be inevitable. Currently, America has two objectives to achieve in any conflict with China. The first being the complete destruction of its air and naval forces, and the second being the toppling of its communist government. The total destruction of all Chinese naval and air forces are a non-negotiable objective, meaning that no matter how the war went, unless it somehow went extremely poorly for the US, there would be no negotiations for a ceasefire until this objective was met. The US would direct all of its efforts and resources at ensuring that no Chinese naval or air forces survive the conflict. And the reasoning is quite simple. China cannot hope to fight a second war if its navy and air force is destroyed, and a lengthy rearmament period would take a decade or more, giving ample opportunity for the US and allies to rearm themselves. The removal of China's communist government is an ancillary objective, which would be carried out via precision strikes, covert operations, and psychological operations aimed at the Chinese citizenry. Given that a purely military removal of China's government would require a full-scale land invasion, the US is happy to wage a war and not meet this objective, or leave it in the hands of a civilian population riled up by aggressive psychological operations. In the first scenario, it's unlikely that a draft would be instigated by the US government, given the US's advantages in naval and air forces both. Though both the American Navy and Air Force would suffer significant losses in the effort, China would indubitably face the complete annihilation of its own Navy and Air Force to the Americans and their allies. In this case, reservists would likely be enough to bring American combat strength back to manageable levels, and a draft would be highly unlikely. Yet, if the scope of the conflict expanded for any reason, and a direct removal of China's communist government was the only road to peace, an American draft would be a necessity. With over 2 million active duty forces in the Chinese military, the US and its allies would need to bolster their own numbers significantly to even attempt an invasion of China. All male American citizens and immigrant non-citizens between the ages of 18 and 25 are required by law to register in the Selective Service System. In 2010, the SSS had over 16 million young American men on file, yet the US has a total fit-for-service manpower pool of over 111 million. With an increasingly bloody conflict against China, the SSS would without a doubt be activated, and full-rate conscription would begin for the first time since Vietnam. War with China is not likely, and yet it is considered the most realistic and probable flashpoint for the world's next major war. While the world has not seen any major powers go to war since the end of World War II, and it will hopefully not see them do so ever again, the reality is that several of any possible diplomatic missteps in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait could lead to an unavoidable conflict between the US and China. And with the life of the Chinese Communist Party likely dependent on forcing Taiwan back into the fold and crushing the island's democratic government, the US may be headed straight for another military draft sooner than any of us could have hoped for. The People's Republic of China is huge. Not only is it the world's most populous country, with a population of around 1.404 billion people. It's massive land-wise. The country is approximately 3,700,000 square miles, making it slightly larger than the United States in land area. Although China spans five geographical time zones, the whole country follows a single standard time. China is home to 56 ethnic groups. Linguists estimate that there are nearly 300 living languages spoken in China, with Mandarin Chinese having the most speakers, around 955 million people. China is governed by the Communist Party of China, which administers the country from the capital of Beijing. The country is rapidly developing and is on track to become a superpower. Here are six places China is attempting to subjugate to expand its borders, economic, and global influence. Number 1. Tibet China has a long and volatile relationship with Tibet, beginning in the 13th century and throughout different periods in history. Tibet has been ruled by Chinese and Mongolian dynasties, and has also been an independent nation. In the first quarter of the 20th century, Tibet was ruled by Great Britain before once again becoming an independent nation. 
In 1950, Chinese troops invaded Tibet to enforce China's age-old claim to the country. Some areas became the Tibetan Autonomous Region and others were assimilated into neighboring Chinese provinces. In 1959, after a failed anti-Chinese revolt, the spiritual leader of Tibet, the 14th Dalai Lama, fled the country and set up a government in exile in India. During China's Cultural Revolution, many Buddhist monasteries were destroyed and thousands of Tibetans were likely slaughtered during martial law. Due to international pressure, in the 1980s China somewhat relaxed its grip on Tibet and implemented reforms. Currently Beijing continues to modernize Tibet, sometimes at the cost of the region's cultural heritage. Development has brought Han Chinese migrants and Western tourism to the area. Since the early 2000s, there have been protests in Tibet, especially on the anniversaries of politically significant dates. Human rights groups say that China continues to politically and religiously repress Tibet. Various activists worldwide campaign for an independent Tibet. There are several strategic and economic motives China has for governing the region. Tibet is highly important to China's sense of self and Chinese nationalism. Many Chinese leaders, past and present, have believed that no matter the lines drawn on the map, Tibet is fundamentally a part of China. They felt a strong nationalistic drive to return China to its ancient, far-flung Qing Dynasty borders. Tibet also serves as a buffer zone between China on one side and India, Nepal, and Bangladesh on the other. The Himalayan mountain range provides natural security as well as a military advantage. China is currently struggling to find a balance between environmental issues and yet not hinder the country's economic industry. China is hungry for natural resources and Tibet serves as a crucial water source as well as possessing significant mineral wealth. Since the early 2000s, Beijing has invested billions in Tibet as part of its wide-ranging economic development plan for Western China. Number 2. Arunachal Pradesh China also claims that the region of Arunachal Pradesh, the northeasternmost state of the 28 states of India, is a part of South Tibet and therefore a part of China. Aside from India, Taiwan also claims the South Tibet region. Arunachal Pradesh borders the Indian states of Assam and Nagaland to the south, and countries Bhutan to the west, Myanmar to the east. To the north, the demarcation line known as the McMahon Line separates Arunachal Pradesh from the Tibetan area of China. Historically, Arunachal Pradesh belonged to neither China nor India, but was dominated by several autonomous tribes. In 1913 to 1914, representatives from Great Britain, China, and Tibet held the Simla Conference to decide on the borderlines for Tibet. The Tibetan and British officials agreed on the McMahon Line as the border between British India and Outer Tibet. The Chinese representatives refused the demarcation line and have considered it invalid ever since. When China invaded Tibet in 1950 and the Dalai Lama later fled Tibet, India supported the Tibetan government, angering China. During the Sino-Indian border conflict in 1962, China captured most of the area of Arunachal Pradesh but ended up withdrawing. In recent years, tensions have risen as China has publicly claimed the region of Arunachal Pradesh. China is especially interested in a small district called Tawang, which borders Tibet and Bhutan. China has even gone so far as to destroy thousands of maps and make new ones, having renamed parts of Arunachal Pradesh with Chinese names. India, while not growing as fast as China, is still emerging as a regional economic powerhouse. China wants to dominate Asia and sometimes seems to look for ways to clash with India. Most importantly, it's strongly assumed that there are heavy deposits of minerals such as gold and lithium in Arunachal Pradesh. A large-scale Chinese mining operation found gold and silver deposits worth around $60 billion in the Lunzi County of Tibet, which is directly adjacent to Arunachal Pradesh. Number 3. Aksai Chin China and India also clash over another border region, Aksai Chin, near Kashmir. Aksai Chin is mainly in Hotan County, in the southwestern part of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, with a small area on the southeast and south sides lying within the extreme west of the Tibet Autonomous Region. India claims Aksai Chin as part of the Ladakh region of the Jammu and Kashmir state. Aksai Chin is a remote, inhospitable region where mainly nomadic tribes roam. The area was ignored until the 1950s when China built a military road through it to connect Tibet with Xinjiang. India was angry upon discovery of the road and it ended up being a major factor in the Sino-Indian border conflict of 1962. At the end of the clash, China retained control of around 14,700 square miles of territory in Aksai Chin. In 1993 and 1996, the two countries signed agreements to respect the line of actual control, the demarcation line that separates Indian-controlled territory from Chinese-controlled territory in Jammu and Kashmir. 
Not only does China want Aksai Qin for maintaining a direct route between Tibet and Xinjiang, it appreciates the territory for its strategic position. Aksai Qin is mostly high ground with an average elevation of around 17,000 feet. If China ever goes to war with its neighbors Pakistan, Kashmir, and India, the Aksai Qin region will enable it to take a commanding high position. Number 4. The South China Sea As well as claiming disputed land, China has also claimed islands in the South China Sea. In fact, China has taken to dredging the sea and building out uninhabited islands such as Woody Island or the Spratly Islands to tighten its control over the region. Six countries, the Philippines, Vietnam, China, Brunei, Taiwan, and Malaysia hold different territorial, sometimes overlapping claims of the South China Sea, based on various historical accounts and geography. Adding to the tension, the US Navy frequently patrols the sea due to its alliance with several countries. China considers this to be a provocation. The South China Sea is very important to Beijing because it's a crucial commercial passage, connecting Asia with Europe and Africa. One third of global shipping, or 3.37 trillion US dollars of international trade, passes through the South China Sea. Furthermore, the seabed is rich with major oil and gas reserves. The US Energy Information Administration estimates the region contains at least 11 billion barrels of crude oil and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Also, the South China Sea is a vital food source, accounting for 10% of the world's fisheries. In July 2016, an international tribunal in The Hague ruled that China had no historic rights over the sea and that some of the rocky outcrops claimed by several countries could not legally be used as the basis for territorial claims. Beijing rejected the ruling. More recently, some Southeast Asian nations have considered having bilateral talks with China to settle the dispute. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations Asian, has been working with China to create an official code of conduct to avoid clashes in the disputed waters. Number 5. Taiwan China has had an ongoing dispute with Taiwan for decades. It views Taiwan as a breakaway province that will eventually be part of the country again. But many Taiwanese citizens want a completely separate nation. Historically, Taiwan was a part of China. Taiwan was governed by China's Qing Dynasty from 1683 to 1895, when Japan won the First Sino-Japanese War. China had to cede the region to them. After World War II, Japan was forced to relinquish to China control of the territory it had previously taken. Civil war broke out in China in 1946 and ended in a victory for Mao Zedong's communist army. Chiang Kai-shek and his Chinese Nationalist Party, known as Kuomintang or KMT, fled to Taiwan. The KMT dominated Taiwan's politics for many years until after Chiang Kai-shek's death. Having inherited an effective dictatorship and under pressure from a burgeoning democracy movement, Chiang's son, Chiang Ching Kuo, began assessing a process of democratization, which in 2000 led to the election of the island's first non-KMT president, Chen Shui-bian. Meanwhile, China treated Taiwan with great hostility. In the 1980s, relations between China and Taiwan started improving. China put forth the One Country, Two Systems plan, under which Taiwan would be given significant autonomy if it accepted Chinese reunification. Taiwan refused, but did relax rules for its citizens to visit an investment in China. Since the 1970s, the US has been a close ally of Taiwan and has sold billions in defensive weapons to the country. Currently, US policy in the region has been described as strategic ambiguity, seeking to balance recognition of China's emergence as a regional power with the US support for Taiwan's economic success and democratization. In recent years, China has been alarmed by Taiwanese citizens electing politicians who favor independence from China. Furthermore, the Taiwanese public has staged various protests about Beijing's policies regarding the country. Currently, Taiwan's legal status is unclear, in limbo. The country has its own constitution, democratically elected leaders, and its own armed forces with about 300,000 active troops. China wants Taiwan to return to the fold because of nationalism. Also, Taiwan being a part of China is a strategic defensive move. If Taiwan was to become an independent nation with its close ties to America, the US would likely have a naval port and military base in Taiwan, right on China's doorstep. Number 6. Hong Kong one final place where China is attempting to expand its power is Hong Kong. At the end of the First Opium War in 1842, part of Hong Kong Island became a British colony. Later, China leased the rest of Hong Kong, the new territories, to the British for 99 years. By the 1950s, Hong Kong had become a busy commercial port and a manufacturing hub. As the end of the 99-year lease approached, Britain and China held talks on the future of Hong Kong. 
In 1984, a deal was reached that Hong Kong would return to China in 1997 under the principle of one country, two systems. As a result, Hong Kong has a high degree of autonomy with its own legal system and borders, and rights including freedom of assembly and free speech for the next 50 years. However, in recent years Beijing has been treading on Hong Kong's rights. Artists and writers say they're under increased pressure to self-censor, and democracy has been limited. The current leader was elected by a 1,200-member pro-Beijing election committee chosen by just 6% of eligible voters. Throughout the spring and summer of 2019, large protests erupted in Hong Kong in response to a proposed bill permitting the extradition of fugitives to mainland China. Citizens worry the bill will be used to target, detain, and extradite political dissidents. Beijing's response to the protests has become increasingly violent as the citizens show no signs of backing down. China considers Hong Kong a bridge between Asia and the West for business and financial matters. Also, once again, China's domination of Hong Kong seems to be fueled by nationalistic fervor. With Russia hogging all the negative press lately, you might have missed Chinese President Xi Jinping's adamant proclamation that Taiwan will be reunited with the mainland. And he is not ruling out military force to accomplish this goal. But with the vast majority of Taiwanese citizens wanting nothing to do with mainland communist China and American President Joe Biden promising that the US would come to Taiwan's aid, World War III is looking more likely and it won't be starting in Europe. How is China going to defeat the US and its allies? And more importantly, why does Taiwan matter so much that the US is willing to fight to keep it free and independent? China wants Taiwan and the US wants Taiwan to remain free. Both sides have their various reasons, but there are some significant overlaps. For China, Taiwan is both a matter of national prestige and a national defense priority. The island is home to the Chinese nationalists who fled after losing the war against the communists after World War II. And given the difficulty of an invasion plus the support of the United States, reunifying this breakaway province by force has not been an option for China. It's only recently with China's vast modernization of its military and steadily expanding amphibious assault capabilities that the dream of taking over Taiwan is approaching fruition. But as long as Taiwan remains fiercely independent and refuses to bow to Beijing, China cannot be taken seriously as a global military power. After all, why should anyone fear your military when it can't even pacify an island sitting right off your own shores? For the Chinese Communist Party, Taiwan represents an existential threat, though. The nation began as a dictatorship but gradually became a liberal and open democracy. Today, it's amongst the most successful democracies in the world, and that's a big problem for the CCP. As long as Taiwan remains independent, it remains a symbol for the Chinese people of what life could be like for them if they were no longer under the thumb of the CCP. After the extreme measures enacted by President Xi during and after COVID, disillusionment with China's government and the very society it's built around has skyrocketed amongst the youth. To many of them, the democracy lurking right off their own shore is a more appealing choice, and as long as Taiwan remains independent, it'll continue singing its siren song of democracy to the Chinese people. However, there are two very real and very significant strategic reasons for China to want to take Taiwan back and for the US to want it to remain independent. First is a Western strategy known as the First Island Chain. This is a chain of pro-Western friendly nations that ringed the shores of China and Russia both. During the Cold War, it acted as a physical barrier to communist navies in case of war, who would be hemmed in and unable to operate in open waters without being destroyed attempting to break to the open sea. The first island chain also allows friendly navies to operate very close to enemy shores by having resupply and repair facilities readily available and not relying on far-flung bases which would limit loiter time for friendly ships and aircraft. Today, the first island chain strategy no longer hems in the Soviet Union and its allies and instead acts as a barrier to Chinese expansionism. China has attempted to break the first island chain by illegally building artificial islands in the South China Sea, and while the threat they pose is significant, it still doesn't allow the Chinese Navy to break the defenses of the first island chain completely, and it doesn't allow them to push hostile navies far enough away that Chinese shipping can continue to keep the nation supplied with the vital petroleum and natural gas it needs. Another strategic reason to want reunification with Taiwan could potentially impact the entire world, though. Today, Taiwan is the world's largest manufacturer of computer chips and semiconductors, wielding such significant clout that its embargo of Russia has all but crippled the nation's ability to build modern weapons. Taiwan's contribution to the global technology market is so significant that as the Chinese threat over the island grows, the United States has passed emergency funding for computer chip manufacturing plants to be built inside of America once more. If China were to seize Taiwan, it would in effect be in control of nearly all the world's supply of advanced electronic components and be able to threaten embargoes to nations that don't tow the CCP's line. A nation would have a simple choice, have its economy crippled or do as President Xi says. 
So how can China achieve its goals even if it means launching World War III and come out on top? China has already prepared extensively for conflict against the superior U.S. Navy, and has done a really good job of it too. The surface combat ships are still no match for American vessels, with China having approximately two-thirds of the total battle force missiles that the U.S. Navy has. Its air force is similarly outclassed by the U.S. Air Force, which not only outnumbers China's, but has far better capabilities in all but one department, long-range air-to-air missiles where the Chinese PL-15 enjoys a significant advantage over the American AIM-120 in terms of range. However, the US is fast-tracking an upgrade called the AIM-260 Joint Advanced Tactical Missile to not just close the gap, but exceed it once more. US air and naval power won't matter though if it can't bring all that might close to Chinese shores, which is why China has invested heavily into developing a strategy known as Anti-Access Area Denial, or A2AD. The goal is simple, keep American ships and special mission aircraft such as AWACS and tankers away from Chinese shores so the People's Liberation Navy can operate with impunity. At the core of the strategy is the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, or PLARF. PLARF might sound like something you do after a bad burrito, but it's the gravest threat the US Navy has faced since the end of the Cold War, and it might be good enough to keep the US ships out of the Western Pacific for good. A ballistic missile force, this branch of the Chinese military is dedicated to China's vast stockpile of both nuclear and non-nuclear ballistic missiles. China was never subject to the Intermediate Range Force Treaty, or INF, and thus, unlike the Soviet Union and the US, China developed an extensive stockpile of conventional ballistic missiles. Today, China fields about 1,400 ballistic missiles alongside hundreds of cruise missiles. Most of these are older, shorter-range missiles which we could expect to see deployed against Taiwanese infrastructure, but hundreds have ranges capable of hitting US bases in Japan and South Korea. A small but unknown number can even hit the all-important US base in Guam. The PLARF would be critical in the opening days of World War III. Both the US and China hold serious counterforce power, and the advantage would go to whoever fires first. A war between the two powers would almost certainly be a bolt-out-of-the-blue attack, an unexpected first strike using hundreds of ballistic missiles. The targets would be US bases in the region, with a priority target being Guam. However, this comes with certain risk, as striking US bases in Japan and South Korea would threaten dragging those two nations into the conflict. South Korea may be disinclined to join the conflict out of fear of North Korea taking advantage of the situation. In fact, for China to win, it would be in its best interest to proceed a war in the Pacific with ramped up antics from North Korea, enough to rattle South Korea without actually crossing the line over into war. Fears of North Korean aggression would be likely enough to prevent South Korea from doing anything other than voicing public support for its American allies. Japan would be a different story. The two nations are famous rivals, and there's still a lot of bad blood between China and Japan. What's more, Japan agrees with the US that China presents a threat to democracies around the world. Losing a fellow democracy like Taiwan to China could represent a larger global shift toward authoritarianism. China, being the dominant regional power, is also greatly disadvantageous to Japan, whose all-important trade routes pass by close enough to China to be intercepted by its navy should Taiwan fall and the first island chain be broken. Thus, it's almost a foregone conclusion that Japan would join the war anyway, no matter what China ends up doing. The rewriting of its constitution allows the expeditionary deployment of its military, bucking the self-defense pacifist ideology of the past, and it's proof that Japan is actively preparing to send ships, troops, and planes to aid the US and Taiwan. This is a serious problem for China, because Japan provides a convenient staging ground for both the US naval and air forces. A significant number of ballistic missiles would have to be dedicated to striking Japanese air bases and harbors in order to deny both to the US military. Chinese military doctrine states that the PLARF is to be used in a swift, precise, and overwhelming strike against an enemy force. This means eliminating the greatest threat to Chinese ambitions in the region, the United States Navy. It's not enough to shut down US bases and airfields. America has a huge expeditionary capability and lots of friends from where they could stage ships and planes. Winning the war in the Pacific means beating the US Navy black and blue. China is counting on the US's public aversion to military casualties to win the war the moment it starts. To achieve it, it needs to score huge losses to the US at the onset of the war in terms of both men and material. That's why US aircraft carrier strike groups are China's number one priority. Not only do American supercarriers threaten all Chinese naval shipping, but the loss of even a single carrier would result in the death of thousands of American sailors. This is something China hopes it can use to shock and awe the American public into not supporting a protracted war. Because China cannot win a long-term conflict against the US, it simply lacks the material and ability to protect its trade overseas, while it can do nothing to threaten American global trade.
With U.S. carriers kept at bay with ballistic missiles and friendly airfields destroyed, China would have a week or two to achieve its objective of capturing Taiwan. However, China faces three critical problems with its war plans. The first is that any invasion of Taiwan would take weeks to coordinate. Ships would have to be restationed to nearby harbors. Hundreds of thousands of troops would have to be moved from various military districts to the eastern one in preparation of boarding. Supplies like food, water, and medicine would have to be gathered in the millions of tons and prepared for shipping across the strait. Hundreds of aircraft would have to be moved to nearby airfields. Basically, an invasion of Taiwan would be anything but a bolt out of the blue. It would be a very publicly broadcast event that would have months of warning. The United States would use this time to gather global support for either painful political and economic measures against China or to build a national military coalition like it did in Desert Storm. In an unprecedented move, European NATO partners have been sending ships to the South Pacific in the last six months. These routine patrols are meant to signal one thing to China, Europe stands with the US and against an invasion of Taiwan. Invading Taiwan would mean taking on an international coalition. And there's no ready answer to this daunting problem for China, who enjoys few meaningful alliances, and zero who would support it in war against what would in effect be a global force. The second problem China faces is that though its ballistic missile force is a deadly threat to U.S. forces, it might not be able to effectively deter U.S. naval operations the way China hopes it will. Hitting a stationary airbase with a ballistic missile from thousands of miles away is relatively easy. China has reduced the circular probability of error from 100 to just 5 or 10 meters for its modern missiles. However, hitting a fast-moving warship in the middle of the ocean is a different challenge altogether. Ballistic missiles and other standoff weapons need good tracking data to hit a moving target. This means that a ship must be first discovered, properly identified, and then finally fixed. China has greatly improved both its ground-based and satellite-based long-range radar capabilities, but this type of radar can only tell you a ship is out there with an approximate distance. Accuracy of satellites, however, is greater, though they provide only a temporary track as they orbit the Earth. In order to properly identify and then provide a good track, you need a much better sensor technology and it's unknown if China can foot the bill there. A vast investment in drones and AWACS aircraft means that China potentially has the tools to get the job done, but these airborne assets have to face the threat of the most capable air force in the world. China does enjoy an advantage here because the US would have to operate aircraft at extremely long ranges. But a decided uptick in both the purchase of air and sea drones by the US military, as well as a new tanker drone, means that the reach of America's weapons is being steadily and greatly increased. Even if China can overcome the difficulties in hitting moving targets, there's still one Achilles heel it has no solution for, neither today nor in the projected future. China depends on overseas trade for the majority of its oil and natural gas imports. It does have two land-based connections to Russia, but one of these, the pipeline from Sakhalin, would make an easy target for a cruise missile strike via submarine. That would leave only one inflow of oil and natural gas in the far west out of US reach. This would basically be a trickle compared to China's current fossil fuel supply, and within weeks the nation would run out of oil altogether. Its military could fight on for a few months at most due to the strategic reserves, but its economy would come crashing to a halt as the civilian sector becomes energy starved. To add insult to injury, over 60% of Chinese trade comes via the ocean. Except it wouldn't in case of war, thanks to the US Navy. Even if its ballistic missile forces are effective at keeping the US Navy at bay, ballistic missiles can't stop the huge US attack submarine fleet. Surface task forces could also easily choke off China at multiple traffic choke points for maritime trade, including the Malacca Straits, the Gulf of Oman, and the Panama Canal. China is attempting to secure ports and airfields outside of the country so it can base forces near these strategically important waterways, but so far has only succeeded in gaining the use of a small base at Djibouti, only miles from a much bigger American base. With the bulk of the world on the US's ideological side and the vast network of friends and partners the US can use to leverage pressure on anyone contemplating allowing China to build military bases on their territory, it's not predicted that China's forward deployed military forces will grow in any significant amount. The Chinese Navy may be the largest in the world today, but most of these ships are smaller vessels meant to act as missile boats or harass the fishing vessels and oil exploring ships of neighboring nations, not attempting to dislodge a US carrier strike group from a vital trade artery. For all its planning, there's nothing China can do about this situation in the current or even long term, though it is steadily working at building a blue water navy capable of operations far from home shores. It still has a significant way to go to get there, however, and even the US remains firmly in the lead. All eyes are on the Russian bear as it marches across Eastern Europe. But is the bigger threat to the world hiding in the East? Is China actually plotting to take over the world? As a president famously said, that depends on your definition of is.
There's no question that China is a massive world power. In fact, depending on your standards, it might be only the second superpower in the world after the United States. It's the most populous country in the world, with over four times the population of the US. It has the second largest economy of the world, the third largest country in size behind Russia and Canada, and is one of only a small number of nuclear powers in the world. It's certainly the biggest power in Asia, and it might have much bigger ambitions than that. But what are China's actual plans for the world? To find that out, you can look close to home. The province of Hong Kong, which was a British territory for decades, was handed back to China in 1997 after negotiations which created a plan of one country, two systems. Hong Kong would be allowed to maintain its autonomy and run itself as a democracy, while China would administer certain larger affairs and it would officially be part of the larger country. That was the system for a while, until China decided it wasn't anymore, and the People's Republic of China has been tightening the screws ever since, and China has been through plenty of changes itself. Since China became a communist country in 1949 under Mao Zedong, it's been a dictatorship, but Mao's strict adherence to the communist dogma, which led to brutal famines and repression, have long since been replaced with a very different system under Deng Xiaoping and the current leader Xi Jinping. The country kept its autocratic system of government while replacing its economic policies with a sort of hybrid government-controlled capitalism. Under this system, China's economy has exploded and has become one of the world's largest producers of electronics, appliances, and mined rare earth minerals essential for manufacturing. But in other ways, China's modernization did not bring good things. While China is only loosely a communist country now, their security state is still very similar to what it was under Mao, only with a high-tech twist. In the modern age, governments use the internet heavily to gain intelligence on potential threats. That's true in China and in most other countries, with powerful tech companies turning over information to the government as needed. In China, websites like TikTok contain extensive tracking software that the Chinese government uses for unknown purposes. And internally, China has become notorious for its social credit system. This ranks citizens based on their perceived loyalty to the government and their conduct in other ways, with various privileges being granted only to those with higher social credit scores. And if you're under China's thumb, there is little you can do to escape. Hong Kong was given guarantees of a certain level of autonomy for a specific term, but in recent years those guarantees have been largely overrun. While they still have separate elections, Chinese authorities increasingly interfere in them and disqualify or arrest candidates who oppose the People's Republic's policies. This often leads to largely unopposed elections, and the recent COVID shutdowns led to China getting even more directly involved and shutting down protests and public gatherings. So, if you're inside China, you're probably kept under a pretty tight grip. But what if you're outside it? That depends on where you are, because China has been involved in a territorial conflict near its borders for almost 70 years now. When the People's Republic of China took control, it was in the middle of a brutal civil war. The communists ultimately won, but the forces of the Republic of China managed to consolidate their forces on the island of Taiwan and hold it, essentially creating a new country there. The only problem is, China still refuses to recognize Taiwan as an independent country. In fact, while they claim they're the legitimate government of Taiwan, the Taiwanese government, now a democracy, still claims it's the rightful government of mainland China. But the People's Republic has much more power, and they've managed to use diplomatic pressure to prevent international recognition of Taiwan as a United Nations member state. And they're not afraid to punch back against big targets. China takes it as a personal offense when anyone recognizes Taiwan as being independent, even if that person isn't actually the head of a country. That's why most US politicians have avoided paying visits to Taiwan in the last few decades, to avoid causing any diplomatic crises for the president. But in 2022, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and some other members of Congress decided to make a visit to the island nation, and China responded hard. They stepped up military drills around the island, terrorizing the citizens, and one Chinese propagandist even said the country should shoot down Pelosi's plane. While clearly that would have started a hot war between China and the US, and cooler heads prevailed, it was clear China was willing to escalate in a hurry. But is China all talk and no action? That depends on where you look. While they get a lot of attention for their over-the-top online personality, with colorful propagandists spreading conspiracy theories and trying to meme, they actually do maintain a very strong deterrent against international criticism. And it's one Russia is fond of as well. China's justice system is notoriously harsh, with long sentences and the death penalty on the table for many crimes, far more than murder or treason. And while most of the people in Chinese prisons are Chinese, 
They have commonly arrested people from other countries for the purpose of prisoner exchanges. When the CEO of Chinese company Huawei was arrested in Canada, it wasn't long before a Canadian citizen was arrested in China on drug charges. But China's reach is growing fast. No one knows exactly what China's long-term plans are. The People's Republic has made many claims about invading Taiwan, and they're no doubt looking closely at Russia and Ukraine to see how that would go. But it's not going well for Russia. Most of the world has committed to supporting Ukraine with military and financial backing, and Russia has found itself increasingly isolated and sanctioned. While Taiwan isn't universally acknowledged as an independent country the same way Ukraine was, the United States has promised to defend it. So any sort of hot war on the island would likely escalate quickly with potential nuclear consequences. So China might be taking a slower, more global approach. China's internet efforts go far beyond an army of internet trolls, and they might just be becoming the world's most premier cyber hacking organization. While they're certainly not sharing the details of their operations, it's believed that they have three divisions of cyber warriors, specialized military forces that train in cyber attacks and work on behalf of the government, state workers who aren't in the military but are tasked with cyber warfare and spying, and a group of non-government workers who are likely hired by the government and have more deniability when they need to break into rival governments' networks. And they've caused a lot of damage. Who has China hacked? Who haven't they hacked? Countless countries have claimed that Chinese hackers have taken classified data. Australia claimed that a 2013 attack accessed the blueprints of their intelligence headquarters, while Canada reported in 2011 an attack compromised multiple federal departments. Japan has reported at least 200 cyber attacks on Japanese companies and scientific institutes, while China's frequent rival India reported multiple denial of service attacks that may have come from agents of the Chinese government. Ukraine reported attacks during the opening days of the war, maybe China acting on behalf of Russia, and even the Vatican reported hacking attacks. The US has been the top target of Chinese cyber attacks for a long time, with reports of attacks on military, government, commercial, and industrial organizations. Even the largest companies in the world aren't safe. Google was hacked in 2010 and reported that the privacy of its users was compromised. They also went after massive companies like military contractor Northrop Grumman and manufacturing giant Dow Chemical. An attack on Yahoo might have had less implications for national security, but they probably got a good look at your mom's emails, including that extended exchange with a Nigerian prince. So what does China actually want with all this data? Well, if you ask them, they'd say, we don't know what you're talking about. No cyber hacking here, as they proceed to hack another company. And because China refuses to fess up to its cyber hacking efforts, it's hard to say what they're actually after. While they hack private companies, it might be Chinese-style capitalism at work, stealing trade secrets so they can give them to their own companies, allowing them to produce lower-cost remakes of major US products, giving them a leg up in the market. They may also be looking for key access to diplomatic cables in their hacking of government institutions. But cybersecurity experts worry about a much bigger threat. If China knows how to get into the mainframes of major companies and government institutions, then they might be looking for a way to turn them off. And if they were ever to initiate war over Taiwan or another country, being able to kneecap the US's military and civilian infrastructure at exactly the right moment could give them the edge they need to finish the job. But is China actually planning a big move? If they are, they've been putting their pieces on the board for a long time. China has a long reach in Asia that goes far beyond Taiwan and Hong Kong. They unilaterally claim sovereignty over the entire South China Sea, which puts them into conflict with Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and other countries. China's claim means that they have the authority to stop intelligence gathering activities by foreign militaries in the sea, which has led to multiple near misses between Chinese aircraft and those of other countries. The Hague ruled in favor of the Philippines during a recent dispute, and China's response was to reiterate its claims and continue its campaign of harassment. So why does China want this territory so much? Some people think it's just maximalism. After all, if you claim the sea surrounding a bunch of countries, it's really not a big reach to then claim those countries. But the ocean itself is incredibly valuable. With an estimated 11 billion barrels of untapped oil and almost 200 trillion cubic feet of natural gas hiding far below the waves, if China manages to get the world to accept their authority over these islands, they would have a huge leg up in energy production, something they very much need with their massive population and energy needs. This area also has multiple highly sought after fishing areas, which would give China the food it needs without having to rely on imports. And more importantly, they would control access to the food of many poorer countries who would have no choice but to align with them. And when you can't find a beachhead, why not make one? China has been known to take over small islands in the South China Sea, but they've started taking another approach, building artificial islands in the South China Sea 
that let them create unchallenged military staging grounds. These islands are typically built on rocks or reefs that are close to the surface of the water. After dredging the area to create a more solid floor, they're covered with harder material and turned into small military bases. This turns the disputed sea area into what's de facto Chinese territory, and serves as an act of intimidation against any other country that tries to set foot in the area. But is China a threat to the region? So far, China seems to be trying to win through soft power rather than open military action. They're hands down the biggest military power in the region, which means that any other country is likely to back down when directly challenged. While North Korea and India are also nuclear powers, North Korea is typically aligned with China, and India is preoccupied by its conflict with Pakistan. China's tensest relations in the region are with Vietnam, which it fought wars with previously. Now the two communist countries have hit rough waters, with China increasingly encroaching on Vietnam's coastline in the South China Sea while harassing Vietnamese ships. In 2014, China began building an oil rig deep within Vietnam's ocean territory. China seems to be making itself a regional power through sheer force of will, but elsewhere it's taking a very different approach. There's no continent more open to realignment than Africa. Historically, the subject of colonialism, occupation, and a brutal slave trade. Many of its nations only gained independence in the 20th century, often at the conclusion of bloody wars. Now, while many of the countries do have good diplomatic relations with Europe and North America, there are naturally old wounds to heal. And that's why China sees the continent as a massive opportunity for expansion. But this time, they're not looking to intimidate their way into a seat at the table. They're looking to buy their way in. Chinese investments in Africa have gained a lot of attention in recent years as the country moves many of its manufacturing efforts there. Africa is far away from China's expansionist actions in the South China Sea, and as such, many African countries are neutral to China. So when a Chinese firm shows up looking to build a factory there, they're likely to be approved. And China knows how to sweeten the deal. They'll frequently build new housing or other infrastructure as part of their investment, creating potential loyalists down the line should the world divide between China and the US. And for China, investing in Africa just makes sense. Many people see Africa as the future of the world. Not only is the population of the region expected to double in the next 30 years, the highest growth of any continent, but seven of the world's 10 fastest growing economies are located there. That makes Africa the world's best place for future investments. And China has made it clear that they're not just restoring the old dynamic of Africa being used as a looting ground for world powers. They frequently staff their companies with African workers, providing jobs to the local economy, although they tend to be low-skill and low-paid jobs, while Chinese figures hold the higher positions. But is this good or bad for Africa? Some worry that China is setting Africa up for what's called a debt trap, where they invest heavily in a country in exchange for promises of repayment of the investment, only for the profits to never come and the country to be stuck in a state of limbo. That hasn't happened so far, as it doesn't seem like China simply wants to extract resources or money from Africa, they view it as a diplomatic investment as well. China wants to control the tech infrastructure in these countries, bringing industry to many of them for the first time. If China was to go to war with the United States and NATO, those countries would find themselves potentially cut off from a massive infrastructure network as China had commandeered it. One of the biggest concerns about this effort is that the heavy industrialization in African countries is hurting their environment, but the governments in most countries seem excited for the investment. But is there a longer plan at work here? China seems to have a hand in just about every region, similar to the other superpowers of the past and present. For Europe and North America, they mostly have cautious diplomacy and an aggressive cyber-hacking strategy to gain intelligence. For their neighbors in Asia, they approach with belligerence and flex their muscles to claim territory. But for nations in the so-called Third World, there's often an outstretched hand instead, offering heavy investments and possibly an alliance against the older powerhouses of the world. And some think this might be all coming together for China to make a big move. Many people have said the 21st century could be a Chinese century, with the country's economy growing by leaps and bounds. But they've been hit hard by their efforts to contain the COVID-19 pandemic, leading to economic slowdowns. Additionally, they've lost many diplomatic allies in the West due to their aggressive military tactics and their domestic policies, particularly their internment of the massive Uyghur Muslim population and their treatment of other minority groups like Buddhists and the Falun Gong movement. That's kept their growth in check, with many Western countries becoming more hesitant to invest heavily there. Which then leads people to worry, are they biding their time for a military move? China is incredibly powerful militarily, maybe the second strongest military in the world. While Russia has the most nuclear weapons of any country, its weapons are old and unreliable to the point where no one knows how many would even fire. China is estimated to have only 350 nuclear weapons, a far smaller arsenal than the US, 
but every single one of them is in working order, and many are attached to powerful missiles that could hit just about anywhere in the world. They're also one of only a few countries to have aircraft carriers, and their naval and aerial fleets are believed to be competitive with the US's fleet. But their biggest weapon might be how prepared they are. So if China was planning to actually take over the world, how would they go about it? The first step would likely be to plan with some other countries. China has become one of Russia's few remaining allies since the war with Ukraine, helping them get around sanctions and providing vital economic help. So if China wanted to make its own move on Taiwan, or a much bigger plan, it would likely pull in Russia for help. A coordinated attack on several targets might be much harder to coordinate, and they might have a third partner as well, North Korea, run by the infamous Kim Jong-un. Like China and Taiwan, North Korea has never accepted the independence of South Korea, even after 70 years. A three-pronged attack like this might take the world by surprise. But would they actually win? In terms of a full military invasion, we've seen how Russia has performed and North Korea has never been tested against a military outside its peninsula. But China's naval fleet is fearsome, and many believe it could fight the US fleet to a standstill in the Pacific. And when you have two nuclear powers standing off shooting at each other, there's always the risk of escalation. China could not win a nuclear war with the US, but a major nuclear exchange would likely mean neither country is left standing. So China is hoping to avoid nuclear war, and it might have a plan to do so. Could China win a war without firing a shot? This might be where China's cyber hacking infrastructure comes into play. Unlike other military attacks, hackers don't announce themselves. They sneak in under the cover of darkness. Imagine if one morning America woke up and nothing was working. The internet was down, smart devices were malfunctioning, and even the government's connections weren't working. They spend hours getting things up and running, and tune into the news to find out that Chinese warships are shelling Taiwan. Their military has established beachheads in Vietnam and the Philippines, and North Korea has crossed the DMZ. While the fighting is far from over, China has declared their invasion successful and says that any interference from the US would be an invasion of their territory. Surely the United States would arm up, right? Not so fast. Maybe China calls in its chips with Africa and cuts the US off from several key suppliers. Supply chain issues are a bane of Russia in the Ukraine war, and the United States might now face the same problem. China would have cut off its supplies, as will any country aligned with it. More critical and occupied Taiwan would no longer provide America with the key semiconductors it needs to operate much of its technology, and the United States would have to think twice before expanding key military technology. While South Korea's fearsome military would likely be able to hold off North Korea for a long time, and China would likely rein in the North to keep them from using nuclear weapons, it's unlikely that Taiwan or Southeast Asian nations could hold out too long without support. But is this where China would want to stop? Taking over much of Asia has been China's goal for a long time, and if this plan would work, it would have pulled it off without getting bogged down in a global conflict. This would firmly entrench it as a superpower and make the United States look toothless. More countries would be looking to align with China, and that includes India. China's goal would likely be to turn India into a regional client state rather than actively trying to conquer it, and with Pakistan on one side and China on the other, they could put a lot of pressure on the subcontinent. Smaller nations in the region would likely choose to align with China for protection, and China's next big step would be to expand further out into the Pacific. Many small island nations there could be pressured into signing deals, giving the Chinese free reign in exchange for protection, and that might bring China into direct conflict with the United States. While most Pacific islands are independent nations by now, the United States has several territories including Guam and American Samoa. While they're unlikely to try to annex any of them outright, at least at this stage, they would likely start treating them in a similar way to the way they did Vietnam initially. They would just step on their sovereignty as much as they want and dare them to respond. Would the United States tolerate this? That depends on the political climate at the time. How much hunger does the US have for a conflict with a rival superpower? Does the public agree with defending these islands, or do they leave them to their fate? If they're left to their fate, that's another blow against the United States' standing in the world. And the next on the chopping block is Hawaii, an actual state but located thousands of miles away from the mainland. With a strong independence movement, could China make inroads there? So China's plan may not be to conquer the world in a shock and awe military campaign against the most powerful armies in the world, it might simply be planning to expand its power and influence piece by piece until it stands alone as the most powerful superpower in the world. It's late February earlier this year, and somewhere above the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea, a US Navy P-8 Poseidon aircraft 
is conducting routine surveillance of Chinese ships and installations along the group of remote reefs and man-made artificial islands. These islands have been built by China over the last two decades, as the nation lays claim to what it calls territorial waters, despite the fact that this territory is hundreds of miles from the Chinese coast and has been declared illegal by an international court ruling at The Hague. China, however, rejected the ruling and continued to build up its military presence on these faraway islands, reclaiming land from the ocean and building runways long enough to accommodate Chinese warplanes, radar and radar jamming installations, and missile batteries. With the international community rejecting China's illegal claim to the area, the United States has routinely engaged in surveillance and freedom of navigation exercises in order to delegitimize the Chinese claim and to keep tabs on the military developments in the area. Today, a Navy Poseidon spy plane is approaching one of these artificial islands when from thousands of feet below it, a Chinese Navy destroyer suddenly targets the American plane. Using an extremely powerful military-grade laser, the destroyer aims straight at the cockpit, sending dazzling light into the aircraft and temporarily blinding the pilots. Undeterred, the US plane continues its mission, but for a brief moment the world hung on the edge of its next major war. This incident is incredibly not a rare case. As US ships and planes have pursued freedom of navigation exercises and intelligence gathering missions in the area, they've been routinely intercepted by Chinese ships and planes. But why is this going on, and how could it lead to World War III? Since 1947, China has laid claim to what it calls territorial waters within a nine-dash line created by the Chinese government at the time. This extends from the southern Chinese coast almost 1,000 miles all the way out to the coast of Borneo, and extends to Vietnam and the Philippines coast as well. The claim is not just illegal, but incredibly ludicrous. It would be like the United States claiming territorial waters, the entirety of the Gulf of Mexico, all the way to Venezuela. China, however, is undeterred, and in the early 2000s began a campaign of island building by reclaiming land from the ocean and building upon pre-existing reefs. This was a first attempt to legitimize its claims, as no nation can claim water around an island feature unless that island can be proven to support human life. China's answer was to shortcut that clause in international maritime law by creating an island where one didn't exist and then setting up troop barracks and flying in supplies. Surrounded by neighbors much weaker than itself, while the island building actions were condemned, they weren't challenged militarily. The last time a nation had dared to stand up to China was in 1988, when Vietnamese forces were dispatched to drive away Chinese incursion into an island within their own economic exclusion zone. A confrontation between Vietnam and the Chinese led to China killing over 60 Vietnamese Marines and destroying three Vietnamese Navy ships. China officially occupied the reef and has held it ever since. A similar incident was in the making later in 1994 with the Philippines, but the Philippine government, remembering the killing of Vietnamese Marines and sailors by the Chinese, decided to back down and allow China to occupy features within its own territorial waters. But why does China want this massive amount of ocean territory even when it's so far from home? Well, that's because this area of the world is relatively underdeveloped by the gas and oil industry and is home to some of the world's largest energy reserves that are still relatively untapped rivaled only by the waters around the North Pole. The US Energy Information Agency estimates that there are around 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 11 billion barrels of oil in the area, with a 2012 US Geological Survey estimating that an additional 160 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 12 billion barrels of oil are still undiscovered. This equates to trillions of dollars in untapped wealth, and China is willing to go to any lengths to ensure it gets it. To add to the economic prize of the region, the area is also home to some of the world's largest remaining fisheries, and Chinese fishing vessels are already plundering the territorial waters of the nations that ring the South China Sea. These fishing vessels have used water cannons to force the fishing ships of other nations away, and with Chinese Navy warships never far away, so far nobody has bothered to fight back. Only the United States has the military might to challenge China's illegal claims, and it has done so repeatedly. Undertaking what is internationally known as freedom of navigation exercises, US ships and planes have routinely moved through the waters that the Chinese military claim as its own around the many artificial islands China has built in the region. Under normal international law, military warships of other nations must pass through the territorial water of a sovereign nation as quickly as possible through the most expedient route possible. The US, in a bid to delegitimize the claims by China, has instead opted to sail its ships in a zigzag pattern through the disputed waters, purposefully not sailing as expeditiously as possible, nor taking the most direct route possible. 
This places China in a difficult position as it can't legitimately claim national sovereignty when the warships of another nation flagrantly disregard that sovereignty. And unlike the small fleets of Vietnam, Borneo, Malaysia, the Philippines, or Burma, the US Navy isn't so easily bullied away by Chinese ships. Instead, China has been forced to respond with everything short of outright force, often shadowing US ships with its own or intercepting US Navy planes on approach to the illegal bases China has built in the region. While so far this hasn't led to a serious incident, thanks on the part by restraint exercised on both sides, this year's laser flashing incident was indicative of China's willingness to push the issue with potentially catastrophic results. Had the US pilots been physically looking in the direction of the laser flash, the high-powered beam could have permanently damaged the vision of the aviators, potentially putting the entire aircraft at risk. So what if the US Navy had lost the entire crew of a P-8 Poseidon? For the US, that would have meant the death of at least nine American sailors, as each P-8 carries mission support crew including intelligence personnel handling many of the plane's extremely sensitive instruments. With US ships in the region already on high alert around Chinese installation and ships, the loss of an entire aircraft to direct hostile action by China could have immediate consequences. In all likelihood, the US would attempt to use restraint and authorize only a tit-for-tat response, likely targeting and destroying an expensive but unmanned and Chinese military installation along the disputed island chains. If instead the Navy P-8 had been shot down by actual Chinese weapons, and not just accidentally downed by blinding the pilots, the response would be far different. The US faces a very serious choice. If it refuses to take retributive action, then it threatens to at last fully legitimize Chinese claims to the area, not to mention lose major international face as it essentially bows to China as the superior Pacific power. This is… Well, unlikely, to say the least, and an actual shootdown of a US plane by Chinese forces would likely lead to an overwhelming military response. That response, however, would be limited to the specific installation the attack originated from in a bid to allow China the option of not escalating the conflict into all-out war. China would have to accept the loss of what would likely be several missile batteries and a radar and communication station, along with the men manning those resources, or it could choose to escalate the conflict. Escalation would be unlikely, however, as, simply put, the US is by far the superior power in the Pacific. While China can threaten US forces with a large stockpile of ballistic missiles, its navy is simply no match for the firepower of the US Navy. And most importantly, China has not yet demonstrated that it has the ability to keep its targeting networks for its ballistic missile forces operational past first contact with American forces. Even if, somehow, China's ballistic missile kill chain remains intact, an extremely dubious proposition, its total stockpile is limited and once those missiles run out it will be up to the Chinese Navy to fend off the US Pacific forces, which would by then be bolstered by ships from the Atlantic fleet. This is a task it is simply not equipped to undertake. Further complicating problems for China is the US's vast fleet of submarines, an asset that is routinely overlooked by military planners on both sides, and that's something that the US's silent service, as it's known, is more than happy with. With an extremely limited anti-submarine warfare capability, China's navy would be decimated by this undersea fleet, and with the vast majority of its trade coming through the ocean, an economic blockade of China would lead to a catastrophic consequence for the nation. In the end, it's in the best interest of both sides that no such conflict takes place. While the US would doubtlessly emerge victorious, it would be a costly victory with the greatest losses the Navy will have endured since World War II. With China as its greatest trading partner, the US economy would take a huge hit as well. Though unlike China, the US could redirect much commerce elsewhere. Still, a fully armed confrontation between the two nations would have dire consequences for the world and is not a proposition either side wants to see. And yet, China continues to build upon and expand on what detractors have taken to calling landlocked aircraft carriers in the South China Sea, unwilling to obey international law and continuing to bully its neighbors. This leaves not just the fate of the South Pacific, but the very peace and stability it currently enjoys hanging in the balance, and this time, it's China whose actions will determine what the history books say about war in the 21st century. If this scenario seems far-fetched, Perhaps it's not as far off as one might think, as an armed confrontation very nearly occurred between the US and China back in 2001. On April 1st of that year, a US Navy reconnaissance aircraft was operating near yet another disputed Chinese encampment, this time on the Parcel Islands. 
when it was intercepted by two Chinese J-8 fighters. In a bid to intimidate the Americans, one of the J-8 pilots undertook two high-speed flybys of the big US plane, but on the third attempt, the pilot completely misjudged his skills and rammed straight into the American EP-3E. The impact split the J-8 into two pieces and severely damaged the American plane, which was sent to an uncontrolled dive. Incredibly, the American pilot was able to recover the aircraft and severely damaged, it immediately sent a distress signal to a nearby Chinese airfield. The Chinese ignored 15 distress calls and finally, the American plane simply decided to land on the Chinese runway regardless of permission or not, as the pilot did not believe he could keep the plane aloft any longer. The only casualties of the incident was the Chinese pilot, who was likely crushed to death on impact and unable to eject. Immediately after the incident and despite the US releasing flight data from the onboard recorder, China claimed that it was the US plane that caused the collision by purposefully turning into the passing Chinese plane. This claim was in short ludicrous and largely ignored by the international community, especially since China never released the flight data from its own aircraft black box. Things in the South China Sea remain tense and a major incident between the two nations is only one provocation away. What happens next is largely in China's hands, but one thing is for sure, it is unlikely to back down from its claims in the South China Sea and sadly, conflict seems likely. Coconut trees, mangoes, and precision bombers. These are just a few things the Philippines brings to the table if China invades Taiwan. The Filipino and United States governments have come to an agreement that will allow the U.S. to expand its military presence to the northern islands of the Philippines. This deals a huge blow to any plans Beijing might have for invading Taiwan. But the Philippines isn't just a vital strategic location to launch a military mission against China from, it also offers several other advantages. There are over 7,000 islands in the Philippines, and China should be nervous about each and every one. The United States has five treaty allies in the Indo-Pacific, Australia, South Korea, Japan, Thailand, and the Philippines. However, if a conflict between China and Taiwan arose, the Philippines would be a stone's throw away from the front lines as its northernmost island is only 118 miles or 190 kilometers away from Taiwan. And if Beijing decided to go full-blown Russia and invade a sovereign nation, the Philippines will almost certainly play a major role in the conflict in several ways. The Philippines would react almost immediately to an invasion of Taiwan, not because they necessarily want to protect the island, but because there are an estimated 200,000 Filipino nationals living and working there. The contingency plans are already being formed on how to bring every Filipino home if China invades Taiwan. But Philippine involvement in a conflict in the South China Sea doesn't stop there. In recent months, Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. and his administration have been strengthening ties with the US in case China tries to move on Taiwan. In fact, during a visit to Manila on February 2, 2023, US Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin declared that American commitment to the defense of the Philippines is ironclad. Our alliance makes both of our democracies more secure and helps uphold a free and open Indo-Pacific. This announcement was a major cause for concern in Beijing, and it came as little surprise when Mao Ning, a spokesperson for China's foreign ministry, responded to Austin's statement and the expansion of U.S. bases in the Philippines. Mao stated this is an act that escalates tensions in the region and endangers regional peace and stability. Regional countries should remain vigilant about this and avoid being used by the U.S. This rhetoric of destabilization whenever China feels threatened or needs to voice its displeasure over the actions of the U.S. is common. However, rather than blatantly stating that this new agreement between the Philippines and the U.S. is a way to keep Beijing in check and act as a deterrent to their aggression towards Taiwan, both countries state that military bases in the Philippines are just a continuation of the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement signed in 2014. This agreement was put in place to allow for combined training exercises and joint operations that were put on hold during President Rodrigo Duterte's administration when there were discussions of reducing the Philippines' reliance on the United States and forging close ties with China. It's clear today that Bong Bong Marcos wants to return to the days where the Philippines had a stronger alliance with the US. We'll dive deeper into the complex relationship between the US and the Philippines later on. However, it's important to remember that the US colonized the Philippines in 1898, and by its very nature colonization led to the exploitation of the Filipino people and unethical power structures being put in place. But unfortunately, the Philippines has a long history of being colonized by different outside forces, which is one of the reasons why they've kept such a close eye on the situation developing with Taiwan. 
If China were to attack and seize the island nation, the Philippines could be next, or at the very least, be forced to become submissive to the growing influence of the Chinese government. But this also goes the other way. Beijing has been keeping a close eye on the Philippines as its islands and close ties to the US may pose a serious risk to their future plans. Let's break down the four reasons why the Philippines is complicating China's plans to invade Taiwan and examine how this might prevent World War III from breaking out. Reason 1. Military Intervention If China ever does invade Taiwan, it'll be a difficult battle to win. This is because the island nation has been building up its military and preparing for the possibility of invasion for decades. However, if China launched the full might of its military against Taiwan and no other countries intervened, they would likely be able to capture the island given enough time. That being said, the invasion would be incredibly costly in terms of lives lost and resources expended, but the sheer size of the People's Liberation Army would allow China to eventually break Taiwan's defenses and secure the island. However, an invasion of Taiwan will not happen in a vacuum, and this is where the Philippines is becoming a major problem for China. The Philippine military itself is not the most formidable force in the world. It only has around 100,000 active members, which is significantly less than the approximately 2 million active personnel that the PLA has. The Philippines Air Force consists mostly of cargo planes, with only around 25 attack-type aircraft at its disposal, which would have no effect against the almost 1,200 fighters China has. The Philippine Navy is mostly composed of patrol ships, two frigates, and a corvette. China, on the other hand, has the largest navy in the world, with around 50 destroyers and two aircraft carriers at its disposal. So China is not worried about the Philippines' military intervening in their plans to invade Taiwan. What they are afraid of is the fact that the recent agreement between the US and the Philippines will allow the US military to operate more effectively in the region. And if the People's Liberation Army went head-to-head -head with the US, they would lose every time. Therefore, the Philippines and its proximity to Taiwan may be one of the biggest complications in any future plans Beijing has for invading the island. The United States now has nine bases in the Philippines thanks to the new agreement, which would greatly improve its ability to deploy aircraft and naval vessels to the South China Sea and the Strait of Taiwan. This will improve American resupply and operational capabilities in the region. It's suspected the U.S. forces will immediately begin using these bases for training and equipment storage while simultaneously improving their infrastructure. New runways are being built along with other facilities necessary to strengthen the U.S.'s position. With each new base, China's hopes of securing Taiwan without American intervention is slipping away. There are three main advantages that the new bases in the Philippines give the United States, which are three causes for concern in China. The first is the U.S. military will be able to increase the amount of training they can conduct in the region. It also means that other U.S. allies like Australia, Japan, and South Korea may also be able to join in more training missions as well. The more preparation and exercises the U.S. and its allies are able to conduct in the region, the more effective their forces will be in a conflict. Being able to practice maneuvers and tactics in the very location where a conflict might arise gives U.S. forces a huge advantage, and this is all thanks to the Philippines. This factor is particularly important for the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Marine Corps Aviation, which will now be able to easily conduct exercises utilizing tactical air formations necessary to be effective in an East Asian conflict. The Philippine bases will allow more frequent training, and although there's no real substitute for actual combat, U.S. military personnel now have the ability to train in the actual environment they would be fighting in if China ever invaded Taiwan. The experience in Asian combat environments that U.S. troops are now gaining is making Beijing incredibly nervous and putting a real damper on any future plans they had of invading Taiwan. The second reason the bases in the Philippines are a major complication for China is that the U.S. can use them as forward operation bases to project power into the South China Sea. The facilities in the Philippines will allow the U.S. military to procure supplies, conduct repairs, and carry out maintenance on its ships and aircraft. This will provide the U.S. with the opportunity to always have a fully functional force ready to strike at any given moment. One of the things that China previously had going for it, if they decided to invade Taiwan, was that the U.S. was on the other side of the Pacific, and their bases in the region were some distance away from Taiwan. Now, however, the United States has several bases just over 100 miles from the island, and as the infrastructure is modernized, it could lead to U.S. forces being able to stay fully equipped and operational throughout a prolonged conflict. 
by allowing the United States military to operate freely and have nine bases in the Philippines, Manila has provided the means for the U.S. forces to grow exponentially in the region. This has not only angered China but has them terrified. Beijing knows that it cannot win a war against the U.S., which is why they've been using gray zone tactics to weaken Taiwan and bring the island under its sphere of influence. However, this may no longer be enough, and any immediate plans to take Taiwan are now under serious threat because of the Philippines and the U.S. bases there. The third and most obvious reason why the U.S. military presence in the Philippines is complicating China's future plans is that the new bases will allow U.S. forces to launch attacks across the South China Sea and target Chinese forces on the mainland. This would only happen if a full-scale war broke out, but it's the fact that the Philippines will act as a launch pad for combat operations that really has China scared. What it comes down to is that China is concerned about the continuously encroaching presence of the United States military in East Asia. Filipino and U.S. forces have already conducted joint combat exercises and disaster training in the Luzon Strait, the body of water that separates the Philippines and Taiwan. But now these exercises come with a new threat for China. The Filipino and U.S. militaries are clearly planning to defend Taiwan, which will be much easier with new bases in the northern Philippine Islands. However, it's worth noting that the Philippine construction prohibits the basing of nuclear weapons within its borders, so at least that's one thing China doesn't have to worry about for the time being. Reason 2. Economic Opportunity it's no secret that China has spread its influence around the world through trade agreements, shipping, and investment in foreign infrastructure projects. Beijing has been able to manipulate leaders, influence decisions, and sway international sentiment thanks to its rapidly growing economy. China's economic might is its main tool for spreading its power across the planet. However, nations that have closely allied themselves with the US, especially in Asia, are a thorn in Beijing's side. The Philippines definitely falls into that category. Over the past decade, China has been the largest foreign investor in the Philippines. However, Chinese companies are still nowhere near as dominant as U.S. companies are in the country. American companies continue to be the top taxpayers in the Philippines and have contributed more over the years than any other nation to its development. That being said, many U.S. companies take advantage of the cheap labor and loose regulations in the Philippines, but just in terms of economic impact, U.S. companies have more invested than China does. During the Duterte administration, China hoped to weaken U.S. influence over the Philippines and control the country through economic means as it's done with so many other nations. Unfortunately for China, they did not succeed in this endeavor. China still has companies and major investments in the Philippines, but the new administration is clearly looking to strengthen economic ties with the U.S. Manila and Cebu are two major trading centers in the region, and there are huge profits to be made by foreign players who utilize those ports. China is now worried that on top of its military expansion, the United States could use the Philippines to further its economic influence over East Asia. The U.S. has allocated more than $82 million for infrastructure improvements in the Philippines to enhance the access to resources and the capabilities of their bases. This is a huge investment that will bring jobs and economic growth to communities around the military facilities in the Philippines. This is exactly what China has done in other parts of the world with growing economies. It's allowed them to hold power over other governments and influence their decisions. Unfortunately for Beijing, the Philippines will not be another one of its puppets. China invested heavily in the Philippines over the last decade, and now with a renewed alliance with the United States, their investments won't yield the results they had hoped. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Beijing expected one day to control the Filipino government through trade agreements and debt. Perhaps then China could have swayed Manila to support its claims that Taiwan was its territory. At the very least, Beijing hoped that its economic influence would keep the Philippines out of any conflict that arose in the South China Sea. However, this tactic has clearly not worked, which has the Chinese leadership worried. Reason 3. The Philippines is in a unique position to provide humanitarian aid to Taiwan. In the event that a conflict does erupt in the South China Sea, the Philippines will likely see an influx of refugees. This is not ideal for China's plans, as Beijing likely wants to subjugate the Taiwanese people so that the manufacturing capabilities of the island can be maintained once the invasion is complete. Taiwan manufactures over 60% of all semiconductors in the world. This has resulted in the small island becoming an economic powerhouse. However, the fact that the Philippines is so close to Taiwan and Manila has shown in the past that they're willing to take in refugees, Beijing may be nervous that unless they can blockade the entire island of Taiwan, huge amounts of talent and manpower will flee to the Philippines. 
If China attacks, there will be a mass exodus of Filipino nationals back to their homeland. With them will also come millions of refugees. Taiwan has a population of around 23.35 million people. It's very likely that much of that population who tries to flee will escape to the Philippines. There's also the fact that the United States military will be stationed in the Philippines to help with the refugee crisis and offer aid, housing, and services to those fleeing the Chinese invasion. The fact that the Philippines is in a unique position to aid the Taiwanese people by taking them in during an invasion is probably an annoyance for Beijing. The whole point of their gray zone tactics is to isolate and alienate Taiwan from the rest of the world. However, knowing that the Philippines and the U.S. forces stationed there would be willing and able to help the people of Taiwan as they fled for safety is just another complication for China's plans. Reason 4. The Philippines Could Threaten China's Influence in the Region this is probably at the bottom of China's list of worries, but it is worth noting that the Philippines economy is growing fast. In the last two decades, the GDP of the Philippines has jumped from $94 billion to $394 billion. That's an average growth of around $15 billion annually. Over the last several decades, the Philippines' GDP growth rate has been around 5.7%, which is much higher than most countries around the world. However, China's annual GDP change has averaged around 8.7%. Even still, the Philippines' economy appears to be growing at a steady pace with no signs of slowing down. The economic success likely put the Philippines on China's radar in terms of countries to watch out for. Any threat to Beijing's power and influence in the region is not to be taken lightly. A rapidly modernizing Philippines is not something China is happy about since Manila is so closely allied with the U.S. As of right now, China is more concerned about the military aspect of the Philippines-American agreement. However, in the future, the economic implications of a growing Filipino economy may be an additional cause for concern. Now let's dive into the history of the Philippines and how the U.S. ended up with so many military bases on its islands. Unfortunately, the Filipino people have been mistreated by a number of nations when colonized, including the Spanish, Japanese, Americans, and even China. However, understanding the past can also help us better understand the power dynamics at play today. It'll also provide a glimpse into why Beijing is so concerned with how things in the Philippines are unfolding. In April of 1898, the Spanish-American War broke out. After only months of fighting, the United States Navy destroyed the Spanish fleet stationed in Manila Bay, causing Spain to cede the Philippines to the U.S. It was at this point that the United States declared military rule and the American colonization of the Philippines began. The following year, General Aguinaldo declared the island should be free of foreign control and renamed the First Philippine Republic. He waged war against the American colonizers, leading to the Philippine-American War. After three years of fighting, the U.S. forces were victorious and the war ended. A U.S. civil government was installed. In 1935, political movements led to the establishment of the Commonwealth of the Philippines. The United States promised the country full independence within 10 years. Unfortunately, this freedom never came, as in 1941, a new colonizer took control of the nation. World War II was in full swing. Japanese forces invaded the Philippines and seized the northern islands. Atrocities occurred, including the massacre of entire towns and villages. It's estimated that as many as one million Filipino civilians died during the Japanese occupation. By 1944, U.S. forces reclaimed the island, and in 1946, the Republic of the Philippines was granted full independence. However, the U.S. military never really left the islands. In 1947, the United States was officially granted military basing rights throughout the Philippines. Over time, most of the bases were abandoned, and the U.S. military presence did eventually dwindle. However, in March of 1996, China fired a number of unarmed ballistic missiles across the Taiwan Strait, which splashed down just off the coast of Taiwan. The United States deployed two carrier battle groups to the waters around Taiwan to signal to Beijing to stand down and that an attack on Taipei would not be tolerated. It was this incident that led to the United States renewing its alliance with the Philippines and to begin strengthening its position in the region. In 1998, the Visiting Forces Agreement was signed and the number of American troops stationed in the Philippines increased. The United States and the Philippines began collaborating on fighting the War on Terror. Radical Islamist groups had begun operating in the southernmost sections of Mindanao. These terrorists claimed to have ties to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. However, in 2012, an incident led to Filipino and American forces refocusing their attention on China. A confrontation between Philippine and Chinese naval vessels arose along the Scarborough Shoal Reef in the South China Sea. Both nations claimed the reef belonged to them as large reserves of oil and gas were found to be located in the area. Nothing came of the conflict other than the Philippines bringing the dispute before an international court, which ruled in their favor. 
Beijing refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of the trial, and tensions over the Scarborough Shoal Reef continued. In 2016, Rodrigo Duterte was elected president and suggested the Philippines rely less heavily on the US and look towards China for the future. In hindsight, that wasn't a complete surprise. Duterte ruled over the Philippines using draconian methods and an iron fist to punish anyone found with drugs of any kind. Thousands of Filipinos were arrested and killed as a result of his policies. Duterte took more of an authoritarian stance than a democratic one, which might have been why he sought closer ties to Beijing. However, in March 2022, when an invasion of Ukraine by Russia seemed all but inevitable, Duterte came running back to the United States for protection. The concern was that if Russia was willing to invade its neighbor, then China might be thinking about expanding its own borders by attacking Taiwan. The concern was that after Taiwan, the Philippines could be Beijing's next target. Talks began and it appeared the Philippines would allow the US to resume operations at their previous base at Subic Bay and the nearby Clark Air Base. When Bongbong Marcos took over, the alliance was expanded to include nine bases in total. It was at this point that China began to recognize the major role the Philippines would play in hindering its future plans for the region. It is worth noting that not all the Filipinos are on board with the deployment of American troops within their borders. The older generations remember stories of colonization and what it was like to try to build a country after centuries of foreign powers ravishing their lands and oppressing the Filipino people. It was in 1992 that the last American-controlled military base in the Philippines was shut down. American troops still operated in the country on joint training missions, but there were no longer United States bases on Philippine soil. The reason for this was that many felt like having US-controlled bases in the Philippines brought into question the true sovereignty of the nation. These same feelings are once again rising. The International League of People's Struggle is an anti-imperialist movement that seeks to warn people about the dangers of allowing foreign powers to have a military presence in sovereign nations and educate the world about the atrocities that happened due to colonization. They also voice concerns that in the past and present, US troops perpetrated crimes against Filipino women and the LGBTQ community. This has included soldiers being tried and convicted of murder, sexual assault, and violation of human rights. However, in those cases, the American troops were almost always sent back to the US, where they were never held accountable for their crimes. Regardless of how the Filipino people feel, the government believes that having a US military presence in the Philippines is vital to maintaining the status quo in the region. China knows that the Philippines poses a threat to its power and influence now that the US-Filipino alliance has been repaired and new US bases have been set up in the region. Marcos Jr.'s administration has stated the Philippines would stand by and assist the United States in any armed conflict that arose with Taiwan and China. The reality is that the Philippines was likely always going to be in danger if China invaded Taiwan due to its proximity to the conflict. The Philippines decided to take a proactive approach to this threat and allied itself with the United States for additional protection, money, and resources in the years to come. This has left Beijing furious, and it's clear they now see the Philippines as a major thorn in their side. Early in its invasion of Ukraine, when the world turned a collective cold shoulder to it, Russia claimed that the Russian-Chinese partnership was one of no limits. Not long after, the Chinese were quick to rectify the sentiment and make it clear that there were indeed limits to this relationship, with its only real friends being Iran and North Korea. If Russia wants to win the war in Ukraine, it desperately needs China's support, but China has other plans, and it would like nothing better than if Russia lost this war. And not just any loss, the more catastrophic the better. Russia's war to defeat Russia by invading Ukraine is putting the nation in an increasingly tough position as the conflict enters the 18-month mark. Initially, sanctions against the country barely made a dent on its economy, thanks to booming energy revenues as the Western world bought up vast reserves of Russian energy in order to shore up for looming sanctions. But the boom times are over, and now Western price caps on Russian energy are gutting government revenues. These price caps allow Russia just enough leeway to keep selling oil and gas and thus avoid a global energy crisis, but not enough for Russia to turn a profit. In effect, Russia's greatest source of revenue has been reduced to a break-even state, even as the country taxes oil income according to the price of Brent crude rather than its own. This is cannibalizing its own energy industry just to continue financing the costly war in Ukraine. Even worse, as Russia switched to sell oil to India, they tried to make up its losses of Western business, and the Indian government demanded that all sales be made in rupees instead of rubles. This has left Russia with a massive quantity of Indian rupees, which have very limited use on the international market as most nations trade in either dollars or euro. Russia also doesn't need much of what India is willing to export. 
meaning it can't use those rupees to buy the Indian goods it might need. This growing stockpile of rupees is effectively worthless to Russia unless the world suddenly switches to the rupee as the global reserve currency in the near future. On top of income woes, Russia is dealing with a catastrophic shortage of badly needed products for the manufacture of advanced weapons. Sanctions on semiconductor sales to Russia have reduced its military to scrounging for chips from consumer goods like dishwashers, and it's being forced to buy drones from countries like Iran under deals that heavily favor Iran. In the wake of the Russian invasion in Ukraine, the world learned that while Russia is a huge arms exporter, it was extremely reliant on advanced components from around the world to actually produce sophisticated arms. Without those components, the Russian defense industry can only manage to chug out a few advanced weapon systems per month, an estimated 20 tanks per month, for example, and in a questionable state of modernity to boot. China has helped alleviate some of the pressure that Russia is currently under. It has greatly expanded its import of Russian energy in the wake of Western sanctions and allows Russia to use its own financial institutions to undertake some transactions and evade Western restrictions. Further, there's good intelligence announced by the Americans that Chinese defense firms have been providing vital equipment to the Russian war effort. It was long feared that China would announce their full-blown support for Russia in a similar style as Ukraine enjoys from the West. Everything from Chinese tanks to artillery and especially missiles were feared to be crossing the border into Russia, replenishing its stockpiles and significantly expanding Russia's ability to continue waging this war. Despite Ukraine's many successes, it remains outgunned and outmanned by the vastly larger Russian military, which has the good fortune of access to vast stocks of Cold War equipment that still enjoys some battlefield utility. But those stocks are increasingly running out, and China was feared to be the key to replenishing Russian shortages. So far, there's been no sign of heavy equipment being transferred to Russia, despite President Vladimir Putin doubtlessly asking for it during his meetings with China's Xi Jinping. What we do know is that there is increasing evidence that the Chinese government is actively aiding Russia in evading sanctions, transferring large amounts of dual-use hardware like drones and computer chips to feed its ever-hungry defense industry. Chinese state-owned defense companies have shipped everything from badly needed spare parts for combat jets to navigation equipment. And just between March and July of 2023, Chinese companies sold Russia over $12 million in drones and drone parts. For their part, the Chinese have claimed that they're not selling Russia any weapons, which so far seems to be true. However, they also claim that any dual-use items being transferred to Russia are, quote, above board. This is objectively false, given that it took U.S. intelligence and third-party researchers to begin to discover the scope of what China is supplying to Russia. But it's not just parts that could be used in military drones that China is sneaking into Russia. China is now the largest importer of Russian oil in the world, dethroning India for that title in March of 2023. While Russia has not been able to make up all it lost in sales to the West, China now imports twice the amount of liquefied petroleum gas than it did in 2021, and crude oil imports are around 1.65 million barrels a day. One of the most painful blows to the Russian economy was sanctions by the West which forbade Western insurance agencies from insuring any ship used to transport Russian oil. This meant that Russia didn't just lose access to European tanker fleets, but to international fleets insured by European companies. That left it with few options with which to ship oil, given that pipelines to alternate markets are few and so specialized that only very specific products could be sent through them anyway. But here too, China is helping Russia out by providing its own super tankers and granting insurance to third-party tankers transferring Russian energy goods. According to an anonymous Chinese executive, China provided 18 super tankers and insured a further 16 third-party vessels in 2023, shipping 15 million metric tons of crude oil. It looks like short of providing Russia with weapons, China is doing everything it can to help Russia win. But on closer inspection, this is far from the truth. Because the truth is, China is only interested in China, and even its aid to Russia is completely in its own interest, and it comes at an increasingly high cost to Russia's continued independence. Now that last part is not a flaw, it's a feature of Chinese aid. China's been accused of using its Belt and Road Economic Initiative to spread what some have called, quote, debt trap diplomacy. There's varying levels of truth to this, but when looking at China's alleged support for Russia, it's hard to not see how China has its own interests front and center, to the great detriment of the Russians. Firstly, most of the transactions between Russia and China are now being conducted with the Chinese Yuan, with the amount of total Russian exports conducted in Yuan increasing from half a percentage point pre-war to 14% today. This is both a reflection of Russia's increasing shift toward Chinese markets and the Chinese demanding that trade be conducted in their own currency.
strengthening the Chinese yuan directly. For the first time in history, the Chinese yuan is the most used currency inside of China itself for cross-border transactions. Globally, the yuan or renminbi rose to 2.7% of global foreign exchange reserves in 2022. This is good news for China, but bad news for Russia, since, like its situation with India, it's now left with huge cash reserves of a currency that only a very small amount of global trade is undertaken with. At least China's more sophisticated economy is able to offer Russia more of the goods and services it needs, and thus provide a chance to use those yuan reserves, but it can't provide everything. Still, leaving Russia with significant yuan reserves it cannot do much with. But the bigger picture overall is one where Russia is effectively forced to sell its energy for two currencies that the vast majority of the world doesn't do business with. Meaning that the longer Russia is left under sanctions, the more dependent it becomes on India and China since those are the only two currencies it has left in significant reserves, and nobody else wants them. China's political support is likewise completely self-serving. When Russia announced its No Limits partnership, China was quick to correct the record in order to not offend the West, where it has significant investments. To date, Chinese support has been tepid at best, with the nation calling for a quote, equitable peace for both sides. What exactly that entails remains ambiguous, with China careful to word its 12-point peace plan in a way that leaves it completely unclear as to how it views a valid resolution to the war in Ukraine. In point number one, China calls for both parties to observe the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of all countries, but this peace plan was presented after Russia annexed eastern Ukraine. So, does China support returning Ukrainian sovereignty to the annexed provinces or does it support Russian claims of sovereignty? Nobody but the Chinese know, leaving their position pleasantly ambiguous, to their own benefit and to the detriment of Russia. With most of the world not recognizing its annexation of Ukrainian territory, Russia needs a significant world power to recognize its claims or it'll lose them entirely. But as the world becomes increasingly polarized between liberal democracies and authoritarian dictatorships, why would China not fully embrace a like-minded authoritarian state? Why, in reality, does China want Russia to lose the war in Ukraine? It all comes down to what China needs in order to continue prospering and pursue its ultimate goal of dethroning the US as the sole global superpower. And Russia has everything China needs to accomplish this. Relations between the two states have varied wildly from warm friendship during the first part of the Cold War to mutual distrust and even outright border conflicts in the second half. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia was still the big boy on the block and China the junior partner. But the Chinese dragon has completely overtaken the Russian bear, with China now dwarfing it not just economically but politically and militarily as well. Russia's only remaining advantage over China is its nuclear arsenal, but with the state of the military on full display in Ukraine, there are serious questions as to the efficacy of an arsenal even bigger than that of the US. China's working to close that gap too, with massive investment in nuclear weapons in recent years, much to the world's detriment. China has a long memory of its treatment as a junior partner by the Soviet Union superpower, and continued by Russia until recently. It also remembers the territory stolen from it by the Russian Empire in 1858 under a set of humiliating treaties forced upon the Qin Dynasty by the Russians. Russian Manchuria now includes the Amur Oblast and the southern half of the Khabarovsky Krai. It's not just national pride at stake though, as Russian Manchuria happens to not just be strategically important, but also rich in energy resources and, most importantly, water. With China experiencing significant droughts, water shortages have put huge pressure on the nation, and the territory stolen from it by the Russian Empire happens to have two of the resources it needs most today. Russian Manchuria is only the tip of Chinese ambitions though, because the greater prize is the entire Russian Far East. The RFE contains massive quantities of energy and other resources that remain largely unexplored and untapped. It is exactly these resources China is eyeing hungrily. Not only would it dramatically bolster the Chinese economy, but having access to those energy stockpiles would create a secure overland energy supply route directly to China. This is of significant concern when today China faces the very real prospect of having the US Navy completely blockade its sea-based trade which accounts for approximately 60% of its energy imports. Without the ability to challenge the US Navy far from its own shores, having a vast supply of energy delivered via secure land routes would suddenly give China a lot of freedom to pursue some of its most aggressive foreign policy goals that the United States currently keeps in check, such as invading and annexing Taiwan. For its part, Russia has not helped Chinese ambitions in the region much. In 2014, Russia launched its Arctic Development Plan and did not include any Chinese involvement 
nor did they make any mention of plans to prioritize Chinese energy needs. That's all changed as Russia has turned to China to finance significant infrastructure and energy exploration in the region. For the Russian political elite in Moscow, the situation is increasingly alarming. Not only are Russia's energy resources in its most far-flung region being financed by the Chinese, but China's own investments into the Russian Far East overall vastly outstrip its investments by the Russian federal government. Immigration, both legal and illegal, is creating a population that is increasingly more Chinese than Russian. In 20 to 30 years, it's feared that there will be more ethnic Chinese in the RFE than Russians. A concerning situation given the 113 million Chinese are sitting right across the border in neighboring Chinese provinces. Tensions between local Russians and Chinese populations are already nearing a boiling point. There's a deep resentment over the growing crowds of Chinese tourists who are said to be rude and patronize only Chinese businesses. In 2019, tensions came to a fever pitch over a Chinese-owned bottling plant on Lake Baikal, which is the world's deepest lake and holds 20% of the global freshwater supply. This Chinese plant would not only block local access to the water supply, but ship that water to China, where it's desperately needed. The Russian outrage was so pronounced that plans to build the plant were deemed illegal in Russian court. China's not done much to ease tensions and in fact seems to have signaled intentions to eventually retake Russian Manchuria. In 2023, Beijing approved the creation of official maps which showed the territories surrendered under the Qin Dynasty under Chinese control and with their old Chinese names. The statement was clear, China wants what Russia has. And this is why China needs Russia to lose this war. And the worse it loses, the better. Russia is unlikely to simply allow demographics to shift ownership of the RFE from itself to China, even as a growing Chinese population creates an opportunity for an independence movement or an annexation by China. It is ironically exactly how Russia claimed justification for invading Ukraine, the protection of Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. In another decade or two, China will have this exact same justification to move to annex the RFE, a region that's not just increasingly ethnically Chinese, but financially too. While China could absolutely defeat Russia in a conventional war, Russia is unlikely to let the RFE go peacefully and could resort to nuclear weapons to defend its territory. This is where a crippling loss in Ukraine would be to China's advantage, as such a loss would likely come with significant political upheaval exactly the type of chaos China could use to make a move on the RFE, consolidating its hold before a fractured Russian state could properly react. In the end, it'd be a fitting fate for Russia to have its own territory annexed by a belligerent neighbor, but it would be a significant setback for the liberal world order, which has relied on the US Navy's ability to control Chinese trade to keep its worst ambitions in check. Not allies, but better than allies. This is how the Chinese describe their relationship with Russia, a statement meant to show mutual support and cooperation speaks far more about the divides between the two nations. The truth is, Russia and China have as much in common as they have in opposition, and it could spark a war. There are multiple points of contention in the China-Russia relationship. Both are autocratic dictatorships. Only China has at least given up the pretense of democracy. Both nations are seen as unfriendly to the current Western-led world order. Both nations suffer internationally for that. It would seem as if the two nations should be best friends, especially when their chief rivals are the United States of America and its extensive network of friends and allies. Yet, differences that threaten war run deep, and if the two win at it, it might not end the way you think. Historically speaking, China has been the junior partner. After the triumph of communism in China post-World War II, the Soviet Union was quick to become a sponsor of the nation. However, ideological rifts soon led to outright border clashes and just two decades later, the BFFs were on the splits, with China cozying up to the United States of all places. The US-China relationship would soon turn adversarial, however, and China re-gravitated back toward the Soviet Union. By the time this happened, though, the Soviets were on the verge of collapse, and the balance of power between the two nations changed dramatically after the end of the Soviet Union. While the Soviets had been the far superior power during the Cold War, China's rapid modernization during the 90s Russia's loss of much of their former Soviet territory and industrial and intellectual capacity led to a more even balance of power between the two countries. But Russia was always on the declining side of the scale, as its economic development focused on reactivating former Soviet capabilities while China was building brand new ones. Russia was annoyed at the fact that the former client state was now very much an equal partner, and as the balance of power continued to become more askew, with China's economy growing to over three and a half times the size of Russia's. A new ideological divide has sprung between the two nations, with the Russians resenting that it's now the junior partner 
and China reveling in their current superiority over the Russian nation. But there are very real material reasons for a decisive souring of relations between the two states. Russia has long resented the fact that the Russian Far East region is increasingly becoming, in the words of the Russian politicians, Chinese. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's been a major depopulation of the Russian Far East, made even worse by the fact that the new Russian state has failed to significantly increase infrastructure investments in the region. Illegal Chinese and Korean immigrants, meanwhile, have flocked to the region, along with a great number of very legal Chinese immigrants, alongside a lot of Chinese investment. The situation for Russia looks increasingly dire as Chinese firms pour money into the area, with the nation admitting that it has no other recourse but to accept the Chinese money. There's now a very real fear in the minds of Russian politicians that the Russian Far East will soon be lost to southern Asian powers like China. Not necessarily militarily, but economically, as foreign control over the region's developed energy supplies is growing year by year via investments. Culturally, the region is also starting to swing toward China as more and more immigration and investment comes from that nation. With such a weak government, military, and economic presence in the region, it's not outside the scope of imagination that in a few decades, the Russian Far East may push for independence and absorption by China. China clearly has a reason to manipulate events and ensure this happens, as the Russian Far East remains very resource-rich. For energy-hungry China, whose economy has only recently begun to slow down, securing energy supplies is of critical economic importance. But it's a necessity for an altogether different reason as well. China currently has a massive Achilles heel that ensures it will not be able to militarily challenge the United States. And that's the fact that it imports most of its oil via sea trade routes that the U.S. Navy can easily disrupt. Secure landlocked energy resources that the U.S. cannot interrupt frees up the Chinese Communist Party to more directly challenge the U.S., even militarily if need be. To this end, China has been fiercely competing with Russia for control over the energy resources of Central Asia, exerting massive influence and swinging smaller nations away from Russia. However, there is one final point of contention that is deeply souring the Sino-Russian relationship. For decades, China was a dependable and loyal client for the sale of Soviet and then Russian weapons. With no modern defense industry to speak of, China bought most of its equipment from Russia. However, as China has modernized, so too did its defense industry decreasing its reliance on foreign suppliers. But Chinese modernization has come at the expense of Russian trade secrets, with Chinese agents being caught red-handed multiple times stealing or attempting to steal classified Russian technology. China has also violated the tenets of some of its licensing agreements with Russia, especially regarding its fighter aircraft. Multiple Soviet and then Russian fighter designs were approved for license manufacture in China, on the condition that China still purchase Russian engines and electronics for those aircraft the two areas that China remains weak in. However, Chinese engineers began to reverse-engineer Russian components and build their own copies of Russian engines and avionics. This greatly angered Russia, however, the nation was so cash-strapped that it had no other option but to continue allowing licensing of its fighter designs. China's maturing defense sector, however, means it has little need to continue licensing Russian designs. This is most evident by the development of the J-20, which is inferior to U.S. fifth-generation aircraft but superior to Russia's own Su-57. To add insult to injury, Russia believes that China stole much of the technology that went into the J-20, driving an even deeper divide between the two nations. With egos, control over energy infrastructure and supplies, and increasing Russian desperation for recognition on the world stage, who would win if the two nations went to war? Since the end of the Cold War, Russia's military power has kept it firmly in the number two spot globally. However, estimates of Russian basic competency availability of equipment and effectiveness of their weapon system have proven to be severely overblown. Russia, it turns out, is utterly incapable of facing off against a modern military force and is best suited for minor conflicts against much weaker powers like Syrian rebels. Up against even a very small amount of NATO hardware, Russia has failed horribly in Ukraine, and the times it did go directly up against NATO weapons, its losses were catastrophic. Safe to say Russia is no longer the world's second best military. This leaves China as the world's second military power after the U.S., but the revelations about the Russian military has put China's own military power into serious doubt. China has historically struggled to clearly define its military doctrine. Despite being the far superior power, China was still militarily defeated by the much smaller and war-exhausted Vietnam in 1979. China claimed victory, yet failed to achieve its strategic objectives of preventing Vietnam from overthrowing Pol Pot from Cambodia leaving no question to who really won the conflict. 
A lot of Chinese military doctrine was based on Soviet doctrine, and this only began to change in 1991 as the United States absolutely trashed much more numerous Iraqi forces, themselves deeply entrenched in Soviet doctrine, Beijing went into a state of panic. In the first direct confrontation between US and Soviet doctrine, the US was not just proven the winner, but Soviet military doctrine was proven to be vastly inferior. US doctrines of air, land, battle, and deep strikes using smaller number of more technologically sophisticated forces to sever lines of communication and disrupt enemy operations was so effective that in Moscow it was said that the only way to stop a US offensive was with nuclear weapons. Russia failed to learn this historical lesson, but China was an eager student. However, modernizing warfighting doctrine is not something easy for a nation deeply entrenched in the old Soviet order and dealing with massive amounts of corruption. Today, China has attempted to emulate the US combined arms operations within its own military, but while it's likely the superior emulator of US tactics, there's serious questions of just how good it really is. For starters, China's corruption problem might be as deep and systemic as Russia's has proven to be, severely eroding China's warfighting capabilities. It wasn't until Xi Jinping's anti-corruption purges in the late 2010s that China took any meaningful steps toward correcting a rampant and out-of-control culture of corruption across its armed services. But as many observers have pointed out, these anti-corruption purges might have been just as much political tools to eliminate rivals as they were tools to make actual progress on changing Chinese military culture, leaving the efficacy of the purges and real Chinese competency in serious doubt. The problem may still be as systemic as Russia's. For generations, the Chinese military operated on a tradition of gifting, where junior officers gave gifts to their superiors in exchange for promotions. This places little value on actual experience and capability putting incompetent officers in command. Another serious question to Chinese capabilities is the fact that China is yet to prove that it can actually carry out modern combat operations of high intensity. For years, China refused to send its troops on UN peacekeeping missions for fear of being embarrassed by their performance. Even more telling, however, is the fact that China only recently modernized its military with a joint operations command structure similar to America's, allowing for its various military services to more easily operate together in combat and allow for real combined arms warfare. As encouraging as this news may be though, China has also a very long precedent of insufficient or very low quality training for its troops, with many of them being used for physical labor by their commanders in local infrastructure projects and training exercises being neither frequent nor realistic. To top it all off, it's important to remember that China has also never fought a modern conflict. So what would happen if the two powers went to war? If a war broke out between the two today, China would undoubtedly have the upper hand. Mongolia would become an unwitting avenue of attack for the Chinese forces, pushing into the very soft underbelly of the Russian Central and Far East districts. Historically, Russia has kept significant forces in the region to deter such an attack, but as the war in Ukraine drags on, men and equipment are being increasingly relocated to Ukraine. China, meanwhile, has no such commitments nor borders with potentially hostile nations, save for India. But the Chinese-Indian border is too mountainous for any serious land invasion to occur there. Chinese forces would be able to concentrate in the region, and with Mongolia largely doing whatever China tells it to, they'd have clear travel routes to the Russian border. The Russian Air Force would be integral in defending from a Chinese attack in the region, and here Russia does have a significant advantage. While the Chinese fighter fleet is more numerous at 1,200 aircraft versus Russia's 772, China still has a significant number of very old aircraft in its inventory, which would not fare well against Russia's one clear and decisive advantage, ground-based air defenses. Having prepared for decades to fight against the superior US Air Force, Russia decided to not compete with the US in the sky, but rather deny the sky to it by investing in air defense systems. Russia's S-300 and S-400 and now the S-500 are some of the best air defense systems in the world, even if they have trouble shooting slower high Mars rockets down. With the air defense batteries already in the central and far east regions, Chinese air power would be seriously threatened if it tried to operate near the front lines, allowing Russia's air force to operate much more freely and directly threaten Chinese ground forces in a way China couldn't reciprocate. To add to China's difficulties, it would have to rapidly build up expeditionary airfields in Mongolia closer to the front lines due to its limited number of tanker aircraft and fighter aircraft capable of mid-air refueling. In terms of technology, the two militaries are likely at a healthy level of parity, but Russia is at a disadvantage due to the ongoing war in Ukraine and the effect of international sanctions. Predicting a victor and how such a war would play out 
becomes nearly impossible given that the extent of Russian corruption and incompetence on the battlefield so far makes it questionable if it would ever be able to confront a near peer to the US, such as China. But while Russian deficiencies are in full display in Ukraine, China's own deficiencies are as well hidden today as Russia's were on February 23rd of 2022. One day before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia was believed to be a formidable and capable military power who would steamroll a much smaller nation armed almost exclusively with legacy Soviet-era equipment. China, likewise, is today believed to be a modern and capable power who is considered to be a near-peer adversary to the US. There are many indicators that China's own incompetency is as well hidden as Russia's was. The United States, meanwhile, has proven in various modern conflicts that its forces are extremely capable even against significant threats. China has had no such opportunity. In all likelihood, a war between China and Russia today would devolve into a drag-down fight as both nations struggle to use modern doctrine alongside their high-tech weapons. The only conclusion we're comfortable making, however, is that in the case of war, the Chinese would likely neutralize Kamchatka and rout the Russian Navy. While China is still incapable of providing support for major naval operations far from home, Kamchatka is near enough to China and Russian defenses are light enough that the Chinese PLAN would likely emerge victorious. Once Kamchatka is secured, Chinese forces could begin a serious push for the Russian Far East, and while it's unlikely they would be able to threaten much of central Russia, the Far East region would likely fall to Chinese control and be annexed. With a great amount of energy resources there, even at a staggeringly high military cost, China would come out the winner. Here, we get to the crux of the problem as Russia would inevitably use nuclear weapons once its territorial integrity was threatened. Without its own nuclear retaliation, Chinese forces would be annihilated, meaning that in order for there to be any victor in a serious Sino-Russian war, nuclear weapons would have to be used. Now go watch China's World War III plan, or click this other video instead.